And we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to New Zealand Whangarei here in the beautiful North Island where, well, where it's been a beautiful day. And um, I'd like to invite uh, invite you guys to come and hang out with us. And thank you for hanging out with us with a new friend, recently met, a uh, New Zealand musician, metalhead, and uh, acquaintance friends. Probably uh, a talent. A great talent and a uh, what's that called? When asset, asset to our uh, our community here in Fungare in the creative area. Mark Kelly, Mark, welcome. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you for man. You just uh, you put up all all stocks as I say and stops to come <laughs> and join me tonight. And yeah. um, thank you. Hey, wherever you guys are, thank you for joining in. Uh, wherever you are, please keep safe and know that we're thinking of you. Because we in New Zealand are quite, um, right now, actually quite well off compared to a lot of people around the world. Uh, we're able to run around uh, and do our things like normal. Like today, we were out at a uh, at an event, uh, had a stall out there and sold some comics and stuff and promoted what we're doing creatively, plus seeing other creative arts people and so on, listening to musicians busking and stuff. Now, before we go ahead, hey, Helen, welcome. Thank you, Helen. Welcome, welcome Helen. Uh, so... Right, let's let's do. Um, that's enough of me talking. So, Mark, tell us a quick, give us a quick rundown about who you are, so everybody knows. Um, so, yeah, my name is Mark Kelly. Uh, I'm originally from Gisborne. My mum and dad uh, still live there to this day, although they're possibly still on holiday. I'm not too sure. Um, I've been uh, an avid uh, listener of hard rock and metal for a number of years. I think you could say that my musical journey started off. Um, like started off with Aha, Miami Vice, All right. Bon Jovi, Death Take Leopard. on me, man. Yeah, Take on me, absolutely. Yeah. And then we went to um, Death Leopard, Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, Motley Crue for a number of years, mm -hmm. then Anthrax and Fear Factory. And and, and my you, bar for music just got progressively heavier. Yeah, and as that's I've gotten, what I was thinking. I was as thinking, I've gotten older. This guy who did Aha, yeah. uh, uh, uh -huh, like me. And you know, a uh, half of me was like um, that that black and white animated uh, take on me song, man. Yep, yeah, the music video when it first came out. Yeah. But then when we progress and you keep progressing, and the reason I you know I had a chuckle is because of where you ended up musically. Yeah, yeah, That's absolutely. Like, so yeah, carry on. Um, and then you know, as I got older, I started to rediscover a lot of the bands that I'd listened to when I was younger. Like so. A few years ago, I had my 40th birthday, um, and Motley Crue came to New Zealand for the first time ever. So my 40th birthday yep. present was going to see Motley Crue uh, in Auckland. Yep. So that was really cool. That was an amazing, uh, an amazing thing to have happen. Um, but nowadays, my my scope of music isn't as narrow as what it used to be. Okay, and it's a lot wider in terms of types of music that I now listen to. Um, I'm a dad, uh, right. first and foremost, very proud to be a father. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I'm enjoying being in Whangarei. To me, it just reminds me of a larger Gisborne, you know, being Gisborne. where I'm from. Yeah. Yeah. I celebrated to, uh, the millennial on Gisborne. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it was like, I was there for about a whole week. And even though we were stuck at a camping thing, I got to see Gisborne. And you're right. It feels like from array it's like a straight street isn't it it's like just one street pretty much sort yeah. of town like we have you we know with bank street but we've got all this stuff going on but yeah it's pretty it's quite an open you know um it's not it's not auckland no and it's not thank uh, god no yeah it's it's very communal and i think yeah. that's a great thing about Gisman. that think, is yeah cool man so what what in, brought you here to Fungare, then? um one reason my son right um that was it. My, I was living in Auckland. I was a project manager for the retail uh, segment for Two Degrees. Yep. And um, I just wanted to be here to be closer to my son so I could be like, so I could have shared care of him, like 50 50 care. That was it. Now, this <coughs> is like your band actually what finished up in 2013. 2013 is sort of roughly about when we folded, yeah. And then seven years earlier, you guys formed. How do you guys form? Uh, so that's a really good question. So um, if we go back a few years before that, I happened to be in a repping role where I was traveling all around New Zealand. 
and I happened to be in Queenstown for a weekend and I was repping for a, a video company yeah and I happened to go into video easy in Queenstown yeah and I met a guy there him and I got on really really well I was staying for the weekend he was like look let me take you out let me show you round yeah. and we got on and we were just we were friends pretty much from that point onwards yeah fast forward a few years um had a few personal things happen in my life yeah and um uh, him and I reconnected again. Now he was living in Auckland this time and I was living in Hawke's Bay. Mm. And he was like, well, why don't you move up to Auckland? So okay. I was like, okay, cool. He was in a pre, pre-established band. Uh, the name okay. of that band was called Remote. And um, okay. they, they'd, they'd, they'd been around for a little while. They'd started writing music. They've been, they were a hard rock band. Yep. Um, bunch of amazing guys and um, they started writing heavier music, which wasn't in the style of what remote was. So they were writing more metal. Right. So And not hard rock. Not hard rock. Okay. Um, so they were looking to make a change. Um, I went up to Auckland for, uh, it was like three or four days, uh, went to the studio where they were mm-hmm. practicing, and we got to talking. They handed me a CD yeah. um, just of the songs. Um, I promptly forgot about it um, and then rediscovered it and then put some vocals to it, sent it up to them, and then they promptly did nothing about it. And then about a month after that, they said, cool, when can you move to Auckland? So these guys at that point, even though they had a band and um, yep. doing hard rock, yep. they hadn't gone, they didn't have a lead singer or they had somebody no, they else? No, they had another lead singer, but his voice wasn't right for the style of music where right. they were heading. I did... Um, a very uh, a guttural vocal. Mm. So uh, easiest way I say to people people to explain it is just think Cookie Monster, right? Singing, yeah, basically. Not the you know I guess you could say the C is for Cookie song, yeah. You know um, where it's you're still growling but in a dynamic range, and you could still hear the um, like sort of it's understand what's going on. Somewhat so. audible, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so how did the other guy feel? Because did he like it was like because I know I'm just you know when you get new um uh, new singers for bands uh that are more well known like you look at Elson Chance right yep so, absolutely um <laughs> is it Mark the new singer uh William Duval William I was Mark and was like one of those things yeah for me it's like so William Duval comes in yes. Lane's been dead for a few years yeah Jerry wants to get together and carry on because Jerry's a musician right and. He's built up, um, and he's uh, of course, even though Lane's like the lead singer and has been the face of the uh, of the um, of the band. Yep. He's also, you know, puts puts his feel on it. But yep. Jerry's the guy who comes up with the riffs, comes up with the <coughs> form of the music, mm-hmm. and also is a co-writer and sometimes the writer on most of the lyrics. So it's yep. his. And he's also when he's in there, he's singing as well. He's doing the harmonies and stuff. Yep. And yeah, sure is. I never realized it until years later. I was like, wait. This, I just thought it was just Jerry just doing a different voice on record and stuff. Mm, yeah. So how does um, this gentleman, you know, who's who's in a remote, suddenly, you know, between the two of you, does he go, well, you know, yeah, I can see where you guys are going as a band. No, I can't do that. So I'm gonna step back. And so okay, start. great question. So what happened was, um, remote was his band, right? His project. So the rest of the band quit. Oh, they okay. all left. All right. And then they started this new thing for, with me. Now, we kept it under wraps for a few months mm-hmm. because we obviously, we hadn't written any material. Yeah. Um, I'd written lyrics for one song. Right. Um, um, but then we spent a year pretty much in a production studio mm-hmm. writing a set's worth material, mm-hmm. lyrics, and then we were then no, we started so practicing. When you say a set's worth of material, yeah. how many songs is it? How many songs are those? Well, it's essentially you have like when you're an opening band, you you often get a half hour set, twenty minutes, right. half an hour, um, and that depends uh, what you can achieve in that period of time frame. It's really up to you. If you just go for it and you have no breaks or conversation or anything like that you can often get five songs in a 20 minute slot yeah um most times with you know when you're playing the metal style of music you're quite aggressive 
yeah. with the the type of guitar music that you're doing so yeah. strings need to be tuned quite consistently um so you know you might get four to five songs in a 20 minute slot but usually at that time it was um yeah you get you get half a dozen songs mm. half a dozen songs into a good 30 minute slot mm. um gives you a bit of back and forth with the audience as well gets you to explain things and what was going on uh who you were as well yeah because you're trying to establish yourself in that 20 minutes as well. That's so it. It's, that's it. I mean, even though um, everybody's there <laughs> to see mainly, 99% of people are there to see the main headline band. Yeah. You just still, you still want to be there and say, hey, look, we're not just opening. We want you to let on, you know, follow us, talk to us. And, you know, uh, and of course, this is back a few years. So yeah, Instagram yeah. wasn't a big thing or, yeah. you know, social media wasn't a big thing. But you still want people to come recognize your band and name wherever you were because but then you only got 20 minutes to do that in. Correct, so we were we were quite lucky because the name Remote was quite well known okay. in the Auckland area um, when it was discovered throughout the, the wider music scene mm -hmm. of Auckland that four of the five Remote members yeah. were gonna be starting a new band. There, yeah. there was certainly a bit of um, interest. Unfortunately, we did lose a bass player. Yeah. Um, he, he ended up leaving because the music was too heavy for him. Yeah. And that was okay. We respected that. We ended up um, going through, we ended up auditioning a couple of bass players. And then we found um, a guy who was a drummer who mm -hmm. couldn't find a gig as a drummer. So he learned bass so he could just be on stage to perform. Because once you're up on stage and you're performing, and that's that's it's kind of where you want to be. It's, it's kind of weird. You kind of often kind of the the change between like usually it's a guitar to bass and ba backwards right yes with musos. absolutely you don't normally see people from drumming turn to bass uh so how hard was it for him to change um i think he 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 played guitar um at home just for just for fun right. um but essentially rhythm and bass uh sorry bass and drums make up the core rhythm yeah. section right yeah. so that meant he was able to lock in with the drummer very very tightly right um him and uh, uh, the main guitarist and our main songwriter gareth mm. he um him, those two spent quite a bit of time together yes so that um he would able to at least be able to play the root notes of the song yeah so he was able to provide that sort of low end so low was end he it. was he a metal drummer or um because uh, no rock yeah pretty much a rock drummer so so, uh, so remote is gone. Yes, we had a new bass player. Yes, uh, more four piece band. Yeah, five piece. Uh, yep. Set up, set up five piece, uh, four piece band. Then you were in here now, and you've spent like uh, so now you're a five piece, and you've set up for a whole year putting together like four to five songs. Yeah. Uh, now you were writing the songs, or um, writing songs? <clears throat> I came in and there were three songs already pre written. Okay. Um, there was the first one, which uh, was was our was the, I guess you'd say the lead single. Yeah. Um, and then you had the other two. So the first one uh, is a song called Darkest Green. Yeah. Um, that then led, and then we had our, our second song, which was called Mind Without Rest. Right. Now we had a third song, and during that year we would try and we worked on that song really really hard, but we could just never make anything of it. So eventually we scrapped it. Right. What what happens is is you go through a period of time where you write and you write and you write, but then as you start to refine, yeah. you understand that that song dynamics and structure and things just aren't working, and you know for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So a year might seem like a, a long time to write six songs, especially when you consider that that two of them were already essentially written. So we're trying to come up with another four, right? But to create another four you've essentially got a scrap four so you're essentially you're writing eight songs from scratch you're practicing right. twice a week um yeah. and, and you there's, there's like about two hours sessions yeah, right yeah so you two got six sessions yeah six uh, what's that like um 120 minutes 52 times a year in that period so yeah pretty heavy practicing yep and you're doing this uh, at the house or are you doing it so one of um my guitarists was the production manager for a radio station in auckland right so he had a studio that we actually went into um uh, went into practice and you know and all that sort of stuff as well did you have to pay for this or was no. it like okay because no. you contact you would yeah. get the space yeah right. uh, 
then you came up um so you started performing gigs or did you go out to like did you go out to um do groups shows or did you just put yourself out there straight away um in the first year we got invited to play a few shows but we were never never quite comfortable okay. um you know one of the big things is like we were all everyone else in the band was a seasoned musician at their instrument right apart from the bass player but he'd been playing music for well over you know, 15 20 years yeah i'd been a metal growler yeah for about a year beforehand right and that was about it right and that was purely a fun project that i'd been doing um with another friend of mine <laughs> in gisborne and right you know it, it was just one of those things I'd, I'd never done it before right so how do you guys like um which is you know people knew remote so now people know all these musicians yep did the doors open for you guys to get on stage or did you have to go in and say this is our demo i know uh, so we <clears throat> um now this is this is a number of years ago this is before facebook yep, yep. so myspace yep myspace was definitely a thing um we put a few songs up on myspace and um when they got up we started getting a bit more interest from other people yeah. as well and eventually we got booked on um we got asked if we'd like to attend a show excuse me <coughs> um so pretty much from that point onwards yeah um you know it was it was a really nice flow and effect i mean the first few years that we were going um we we actually had a pretty good run we had a pretty good run yeah um we would always be traditionally the opening act because we had to pay our dues and stuff like that yeah but we played some really good shows i well, got to meet some really cool weird, people yeah. the weird thing in this like this um the norm now is that people like you know half our age they don't understand the whole thing of dues yeah and they think that like i'm going to get out there and boom get a myspace uh like my youtube video going on showing mm. our band and we're in but there's all those other more established people already know yeah sure got that space already yeah. to go so how hard was it to pay your dues as such um we like we were an opening act or a second act for like two three years hmm. and that's two three years after we started gigging so that first year we we're writing so two three years after that wow. yeah yeah it's a long time it, yeah um, I mean, like you you've already spent a year of practicing and yes. now you still you know you're sort of like try and prove yourself for another two years yep don't now also keep in context we all had full-time jobs right we were all working there is no money to be made at yep. new zealand metal yeah um at least at that time there wasn't um so we we had jobs we were working plus practicing yeah plus putting gigs in wherever possible like if we got a call saying would you guys like to come and play a show mm. um it would just pretty much be a yep yep we're there yeah with it so did you tour and that those two um two to three years did you guys tour um new, uh, around northland or did you go to i mean north island or always south, south island as well or? um so uh, uh we we did mainly we did like what i would call weekend tours right. um because i ended up being the manager and booker and those sorts of things yeah. um uh, we ended up doing small little tours like we would mm -hmm. do Tarong and we're going to be Hamilton a few times played uh Whangarei, the red eye a few times yeah. um uh Napier Palmerston North Wellington we did all those sorts of all those sorts of things but mm. it wasn't until we we got a got our first album completed right. that the doors opened a little bit more because now we actually had a body of work that we could present yeah. um once we had a music video um once we could say that we'd played international support as well um you know then we started getting a little bit more credibility so so you got your first album out mm -hmm. how hard was it to pick up the first single to make right say this is going to be single <clears throat> we're going to put all the money behind this to make a video or did you have somebody else bring in money to put it behind that video um so uh, it's probably really important to point out at this point that we had no money okay we were a fully self-funded independent band right um we we would take each of us mm. would put money 
into a bank account each week. Right. On average, five meet people, 20 bucks per band member, 100, right. bucks in. 100 bucks in a week. All right. So for our, for our first album, <clears throat> um, when we lost our first bass player that played with us live, mm. our, our next bass player, he had a home recording studio. Cool. So we recorded everything at his house. We paid a guy a couple of hundred bucks to master it for us. Now what mastering is, is it means you go through, you make sure all the levels are correct. There's no um, issues with the audio or anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. We had a friend of ours who designed the album cover um, and we bought him like a, a little drawing tablet because yeah. that's what he wanted. And I, I got those um, yeah. at a discount from work. So it was like, great. Yeah. Um, and then the only cost we had was getting the CDs manufactured mm. and then getting the artwork printed. Um, and I was able to buy some CD cases through my job at the time. Right. So the whole first album exercise cost us just under a thousand bucks. Unheard of. Yeah. Now the, now the music video yeah. that um, was done, where I shot it um, mm. and directed it. Um, and I'd borrowed, uh, I had, close connections and we used a um sony hd cam yeah at the time um i borrowed that over a weekend um we filmed it kind of in a, or around our practice space yes yeah. and it's it is your typical band playing right you know in a warehouse yeah type, I, I, uh, type music video there's nothing it's, it's not going to set yeah. the world on fire or anything like that but it was our first video we were incredibly proud of it but I mean, most bands do that. It's not like, it's not like, I mean, in the sense of like saying, oh, well, you know, it's like a typical band. And not in the sense that it's a bad thing, mm. right? Because a lot of bands do that. Even like huge name bands still do that because they're going, look, we don't want to make it look like it's a million dollar song, um, you know, music video because then you guys aren't going to listen to it. Yeah. You're just going to think, oh, we, you know, <clears> we're just, you know, trying to so so clean it out so much that it doesn't feel like a live thing. Yeah. Like even you look at Nirvana video, right? So all you got is these guys doing their thing and yet that pops off. And then later on, I think there was some other videos that I didn't even remember wanting to watch. I just like, that's the only video I think of. Yeah. Right? Because it's the one, the first video, but also the one that had the energy. You know, this is what they Yeah, doing, but you know? that, that video was also really expensive. How much did it cost you guys? Um, or the video that we shot? Yeah. Nothing. Right. It cost us a dime. The Nirvana video cost quite a bit of money. Right. Because um, they had what? Is it Griffin? Is it a Giffen. Giffen. Yeah. Giffen Records. Um, you know, we were we were lucky. We used a lot of contacts that we had with a lot of different people yeah. throughout different areas of the industry mm -hmm. um, to be able to help us, to be able to help um get the band up and running yeah make sure we were functioning um as the manager it was sort of my job to build the relationships mm. um get us on tours um you know get us active so you're probably putting in like what something about 60 70 hours a week like you do, you got to work yeah you got yeah. To other yeah, yeah 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 so you're putting about 20 30 hours a week <clears> to <throat> make sure this band is uh you know getting notified um you know getting in touch with people yep Get, answering calls, yep. sending out emails, uh, messages, whatever, and just making sure that you're not missing any gigs and whatever uh, you know appointments you got to make to put yourself out there. Yeah. So, how was the reception to the video? Um, the reception was really, really good. We we released the video, and then about a week or two weeks mm -hmm. later, we got asked if we would like to be part of. Um, a little venture that was happening being organized by another person called Metal at the Movies. Okay. Um, and this was being screened uh, at the, um, I think it's the events or Hoyt Cinema and Botany Downs. Okay. Um, and we were part of maybe 10 other bands that were yeah. going to be putting forward music videos. Um, so we, we submitted that's ours, that's we really went, we had a good night. It was yeah. really cool to meet all the other bands and some bands we'd never even heard of before yeah. and just watch their videos compared to ours and we would all talk and mm. you know it was it really was part of a, a community but mm. you know i think that i think that probably the biggest thing to point out is um back then and we're probably talking well over you know we're probably talking 10 12 years ago um i myself and the band we didn't look like metal yeah 
We didn't look like the metal guys. We didn't so have, have the, the long We hairs. didn't have the long right. axe hair. We didn't all wear black. Right. Um, we weren't heavy drinkers. There was no drugs involved. Um, you know, we all worked very respectable jobs. Right. Um, so we we were kind of the opposite of what the metal, the, I, I guess what the impression people have of metal is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, that was that was actually quite funny. Like, as um, you know, as we were talking about before, when uh, we were doing the um, writing in that first year, when we were practicing in a production studio, yeah. that production studio was in um, oh my god, Ponsonby, right? A metal band, yeah, in Ponsonby, the high end um, place in Auckland, yeah, in New just Zealand. across the road from the uh, I think the yeah. restaurant. That's like that's you know there's a lot of celebrities that go there and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, we were the opposite of a lot of the other bands at the time, like yeah. um, Eight Foot Sativa, right? We're so, the big ones. So you weren't the, you you guys weren't the image band. No, we were the. So there was no no, no sort of like you know, the logo, the hair, the no. jeans, the boots. No. So what? No. How? Not having that sort of image. Yeah. How were you guys at you know meeting these people in the middle of the movies? How did, you know, what was it like? Because everybody there is like a, the scene, right? Uh, it very, very much seemed like, yeah. you know, denim jacket and, and black with, you know, black leather jackets yeah. and, you know, the traditional band tees. I mean, we wore band tees. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, you know, when I was up on stage, I just, I wanted to be comfortable. Yeah. So we all, I took a leaf out of my, my dress sense. Yeah from Pantera, I guess, you know, yeah. Phil Anselmo, the lead singer, um, they always wanted to be up on stage in comfortable clothes. Yeah. So I had a very nice pair of shoes that I wore. Yeah. Um, I have denim jeans, I had a black t-shirt with my own logo on there. Yeah. And I, I was just comfortable. And yeah. and for us, that's, that's all it was. You know, I didn't, you know, um, sort of a couple of years after having touring and mm. stuff like that, the, the oh, you remember the emo skinny jeans phase? Yep. That, yeah. that, so he is hanging his head in shame. I never wore it though. Um, I, I was always a baggy, like my metal days goes way back to the 80s of 83. No, 86, 7 with um, putting patches, tearing up my own jeans because I was into clothing and, you know, like being mean in clothing, you'd like, tear up and um you know the cotton you'd sort of like oh, spread yeah. it out yeah, yeah, yeah. and then underneath it you put in your patch and so there'll be a black patch of uh iron maiden or scorpions yeah and like, anthrax yes you yeah. can see through it yeah. so and then also you know have the punk um spikes on yeah so i understand trying to having that scene and then being comfortable but i mean like you're creating your uh who you are even like right now right so i'm wearing a uh, comic book T-shirt, comic book hat mm -hmm. from two different, um, you know, from two different uh, companies, but it's comfortable. Yeah, right? yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I have a suit and tie. I have like the shirts. I have really expensive clothes and stuff, but I I don't think comfortable, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how did yeah? So how did you, back, you know back to this thing? Because I think mm -hmm. the movie mo uh, metal of the movies is yeah. such a awesome idea. Yeah, it's very cool to be able to showcase. Hey. Here's a, a whole bunch of people yeah. doing their thing, and here's my peers, mm. and and nobody's getting an award, right? No, well, no, there's nothing. It's nothing just for it. mingle and hang out, and afterwards, yeah. So what was it like afterwards, having seen everybody's videos? Um, so, so uh, I think the cool thing was is the bands we knew, we knew, and we would go and hang out with them, right? <laughs> um, but the bands that we hadn't met or hadn't seen or really heard anything from before, yeah. it was an opportunity for us to go. Hey, you know, we saw your video. We quite liked it. Um, you know, here's some details. Maybe we should go, you know, play a couple shows. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a networking event. Yeah. Um, and it's an opportunity to showcase who you are as people. Um, because although the metal scene is traditionally, it can be seen as quite closed off, yeah. a little bit exclusive. Yeah. Um, uh, it it can be in some parts of the scene mm. but most of the time everyone just kind of wants to just hang out and chill yeah. and be friends and no um it's more like it's it's community element like every other thing yeah and so you got your people that like to just get together and have listen to some music at the pub and yeah. you know 
had you know hard rockers and all that mm -hmm. and then you got your special you know more metal i think the higher you go to um heavier you go i should say the smaller it becomes yeah it does um and when you start branching off into different subgenres as well yeah um the the more sort of insular those little groups become yeah. as well um I think when you're in a country like New Zealand, you don't really have the opportunity to be as insular. Yeah. Um, because you, you're not really going to go, I listen to this one band in this particular genre, and yeah. that's it. All other music, and we'll say music as yeah. opposed to just metal, all other music is dead to me. Right. Um, you know, because you're going to limit your options in terms of getting your music out there. Right. Um, now, obviously, with 2020 and the, the year that we've had, live shows are not really so much a thing as they mm. have been so you know you've, you've got people relying more and more on the internet and relying on getting getting their information mm. and their music out that way um but you know uh, and I, I hate to say this because this is going to make me sound old but back in the day um you know you got out you networked you toured yeah. you saw people you got yourself in front of as many faces as you possibly could because you you never made any money from the shows right you made the money from the cds and yeah. the merch that you had that was where you made the money and but that's uh, the other thing is like um when you're actually there performing and you get off that stage yeah and you've impressed enough people to come up later or you know maybe a handful of people or whatever because i've seen how it goes there's not not a hundred people that have seen the show 100 people go buy the merch so you get selected maybe about 15 percent or so if you're lucky yeah and so they'll come in and then you're able to one-on-one -on -one talk to them and say well what was the you know, mm. and so on and you're building um a following through that how hard was it to try to network after metal at the movies and try to get gigs through that sort of meeting these people so i think we were lucky because initially we had the original members of the hard rock band remote um and there you go. I totally prefer the videos that aren't overproduced. Thanks, Mon. Um, uh, it was, you know, it was it was one of those things where because we had these people, we were able to, we, we had a really good starting point. I mean, our second show, we had Paul Martin, who is the host of The Axe Attack. Um, he happened yeah. to be at one of our shows. Now, we had... Um, we played first. It was a show that had Dawn of Azazel. Right. Um, who are a very hard, very, very hard death metal band. Right. Um, and he made a beeline just straight for me. He came up, introduced himself, and I'm standing there trying not to fanboy out um, yeah. too much. And he's just talking to me about how, how, how cool we are, what a great sound we've got, how I'm an amazing vocalist. And I don't know how to react because so, this is the second show I've ever done. And all of a sudden, the guy who's considered the godfather of New Zealand metal right. is coming up and telling me, hey, you're really, really good. And I'm you know, I'm trying not to look like an idiot at that point. So how long has this scene, like, I mean, I know my 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 death metal days goes back and to like maybe about 80, 88, 89, when, mm -hmm. I, moved, when I moved to Auckland and started uh going to the underground record in uh queen street i think it was or tripping who's the guy from tripping mikey havoc mikey havoc shot downstairs and yep. like every you know every friday after getting my paid i'd like getting paid on i think it was thursday or something the next friday that following friday i'd be getting on the bus to auckland city from uh from Pemure and going comic books metal Comic books metal, that's how it was. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like, okay, let's go see Mikey, let's go see Mark One Comics, and so on. And I'd go through the albums, I'd go, okay, this is what we're doing. And the and the more I looked at the covers, I was like, yeah, this this works yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. you yeah. know. But I wasn't too like um it wasn't obituary. I think there was something else that I was into before I got to that. Uh it was UK UK metals. Um so that's oh um uh, gosh. It'll come to me sometime, but like you know, looking at um death's covers, and I was like, Yeah, that's a bit more freaky cover, I couldn't handle that. Obituary, I could handle, yep, and yep. there were some other bands I'd be into. It's like, Yeah, I could listen to this, and I could have my headphones on and do everything else, and you know, just been walking around dressed in my medals and um, seeing the clothes, and then go and work 
at a biscuit factory and then come home, you know, and yeah, 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 and yeah. And yep. so the back, you know, this is like 88, 89, 90. So you look, you know, what's that 30 odd years ago, this yep. new metal, yep, and um, and listen to death metal. And actually, even though I mean, we butted head the other day about the sound of it, I actually understand how it works, but I also understand. It's not for everybody. And I think no. how is that because it's not for everybody and because the subgenre gets slimmer and, and now we've got to talk about uh, is it death of Azazel or Dawn of Azazel? Dawn of Azazel. Dawn of Azazel. Right. So now you've this whole scene's like going to the death metal scene. Is it like what you guys were doing? Is it a bit um, let's say uh, not as death metal or is it like because you're saying you sound a like cookie monster compared yeah, to yeah, like yeah, yeah. actual death metal you can't you got to really listen to the words. And I used to do that, like, really, yep, I'm really getting into it. Whereas, like, um, you know, being a writer and all that, I'm always thinking about, like, how is it my, how is these guys uh, formulating this story and the lyrics mm. of what they're doing with the music? Yep. Yeah. Uh, bouncing it out. So where does uh, where does Fractured sit on the scale of, say, because I know you, you've got death metal being, you know, death itself being the guys who, you know, came around with it made those other ones yeah it was a, out of new york or was it out of san diego i can't remember more sound in florida florida yeah the florida death metal yeah. scene in the um i guess early 90s yeah um death morbid angel obituary cannibal corpse yeah, um deicide yeah all those sorts of bands look that was that was a huge scene back then. yeah um you know that they inspired uh, a lot of um you know, a, a lot of bands, and it was all about how quick um, you could play. That, now, that also around the thing, also around the yeah. same time, you got to remember that Metallica had the Injustice album, yep, and they were at their long, almost progressive metal heavy phase. You know, yeah. because they were doing odd time signatures. Their songs were like five, six, seven minutes long. Yep. Um, it, but then, completely out of left field, Pantera release vulgar display of power yeah and that's not so much about song length that's more about a groove and making people move that that was the thing about <clears throat> a pantera that i loved it was and then out of that comes uh stuff like uh you had machine heads burn my eyes not too um, long after it, that weird thing was like i wasn't i've never heard, i've never got into machine head wow and so it was pantera and there was other bands it was like the weird scenes it was i, I don't know how my music got slimmed the way it did but I'm listening from like you know from like Pearl Jam to friggin' yep. death metal. Yep. And that's my you know and, and then I'm listening to ACDC and Iron Maiden. Mm. So there was no like this is the band that sticks out, but this is the band I enjoy right now. I can listen to all the time. But then I'll go home and listen to death metal. Uh, and it wasn't like you know the whole world. This is the thing about how people think that like just because you listen to a certain type of music, you are that sort of music. Yeah. You know, it's like okay, you, you're a Satanist because you're listening to say something that's like a testament because testament is saying about you know um you know spirit and black yeah you know yeah. or dad side with the lead singer yeah. who burns an upside down cross into his right like, brands himself and so yeah. people think this is the way these kids are and so i think that's the whole scope of like hey there's more to the music and there's more to the lyrics i mean you look at uh, i think it was testament who talks about greenhouse effect and napalm death mm. before anybody was like, really into it and so you're talking about like you know um really and I think I think what Metallica with the with the Injustice one uh, one yep. right really set out to show you that hey metal and the the hard metal yep. right isn't just about just banging your head. There's an actual uh, story going on here, and that you could have a eleven was it eleven or seven minutes song and be number one or something yep. like that in the top Absolutely. ten. Yep, nominated for Grammy. Right, and still class is one of the best albums. I, I'd say one of the best albums music wise that they produce. Uh, and then they go left field and do um, the black, black album, yeah. And I was like, Yeah, this is not for me. See you guys. And so but that, that shows that Metallica understand that mm -hmm. you'll always have people that will try and play harder and faster and more complicated and technical riffs, yeah. And you can just sort of scale it back and be heavy, but in a different way. Yeah. Do you, you only have to look at the main riff for Enter Sandman. Right. That main riff is just heavy. Yeah. And there's, it's what, it's an E sharp tuning. It's yeah. a half a step down from regular guitar tuning. Right. But that riff is just so heavy in the way the drums and the bass all lock in. Yeah. It's a heavy riff. 
and then you got the guys come out with grunge. Well, what they call the grunge scene come out to down tune. Is now, now Pantera, did Pantera go down? Because Pantera, uh, Pantera, down tune, didn't Pantera, Pantera were um, E for right. Cowboys from Hell, D for Vulgar Display of Power. Right. I think they started experimenting with like uh, C sharp and C for Far Beyond Driven and reinventing the steel. But look, here's the interesting thing with all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Is um, right. We, we, if we if we talk about guitar and we talk about guitar tuning, yeah, right. Um, Pearl Jam, Stone Gossard, yeah. lead guitarist, um, writes in alternative tunings, right, right. So what that does is it allows for different chord voicings and structure. But that sort of thing still happens in metal too. Yeah. Um, Devon Townsend or Strapping Young Lad, yeah. um, he rides in an open C guitar tuning, which mm. is what um, C. Oh, I can't remember. How yeah. It this, but it, it's it's, it's more tech. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm not the technical guy. Yeah. Um, please give me, please give us your opinion. Uh, well, here we, we go. We have a question here. Please give your opinion on how, how this type of mu music has evolved. And what you think of American Fractured? Wow, great question. Um, so the when we first started, there was another band called Fractured. Mm. Um, they were a Canadian band. Oh, okay. Not um, um, and they were they were pretty good. But since then, there's been uh, other American bands called Fractured. Fractured Soul. Yeah. All this sort of stuff came out. Um, the music scene for metal has evolved, especially um, yep. because you've got you've now got so many genres of music. Mm. Um, so you know, I you know we 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 got we we tried to pigeonhole ourselves into a category because people wanted to categorize us. Yeah, what are you? Are you death metal? Well, we we have death metal vocals, but we don't. Our music's not death metal. Um, okay, well, what are you? Are you like groove metal, like Pantera Machine Head? Well, no, we, we have groove, yeah, but we have death metal vocals. So we, we coined the phrase death groove, and it was a terrible, terrible name, and I came up with it, yeah. and I was really proud of it. I was like, death groove. Yeah. And I was like, what a dick. Yeah. Um, but you've got... Because once you get labeled, that's it, isn't it? It's like you get... Well, so here's what I used to do is I used to go, jump up on stage, and we and I go, we're fractured, we're metal, right? And that would be it. Yeah. Um, with a statement like that, that that announces that you are any type because our songs yeah, would have like, like some sort of hardcore element. Sometimes yeah. our songs would have like a a, a core, like a deathcore, metalcore element in yeah. there. Um, but when you're talking about the the music and essentially the fractionation, yeah, well, you know, not trying to put fractured in there but yeah, yeah. The, the separation of the genres you've got i mean how many, well, how, got, many how many types okay. of genre can you name so hit so you've got fresh speed heavy rock hard uh dark uh you got european uh what is that from? You, here's the thing, right? So European metal, you've got, but then you've got deathcore, of metalcore, yeah, uh, progressive metal, uh, pirate metal, metal, folk metal. Yeah, I mean now you've got bands like rap metal, the what the Wu or the Who, the Wu, and they're um, Mongolian. They do Mongolian throat singing, right? Um, and then you've got Indian metal with yeah. uh, Bloody Wood. Yeah. Um. So it's so expansive now. I mean, if well, the, the so I. I had a conversation with a friend today and he said to me that there is a, a law about the internet or a rule, I think it's called rule or law 34, which says, yeah, if, if, you, you know what that is, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. If there's it's, a certain, there's a certain type of thing. For right. It. Um, it's, it's almost one of those things where if you've got someone like Scottish metal, for example, yeah. um, you know, you could, you know, uh, oh, the classic one, the boys from Waipu. Alien right. weaponry, right? So Maori metal, moldy metal, yeah, right. So you can you almost know, you, class it as it, but then, yeah. but here's the thing: so <clears throat> there has been always been cultural metal, exactly. Uh, so the Native, Native Americans out there, Cherokees, uh, there's a couple of bands that I've heard and yep. played on, um, I think on the radio a few years ago when I was doing it, yeah, going through all these different, uh, you know, yeah, uh, metals from all over the world, mm -hmm. and and it's like, and also you're talking about Mongolia. I mean, there was. Um, Oh gosh, they're not 
they're not even like these are not folk metal like it's like actual guys using the instruments yeah uh the ethnic instruments as such yeah. in a ma metal way to uh to do the he heavy riffs and stuff this is the cool thing about heavy metal and i think when i i mean my dad my dad had an album called heavy and on that was um cream yes um with eric cups band there and their lead song at that time there was iron maiden's run to the hills um there was um Jimi hendrix with uh, purple haze yeah there's deep people's smoke on the water a classic All right um and so you had all these different bands on there and i think there was like back and black or something from icdc mm -hmm. and that was kind of my introduction to metal and so straight away there was all these different ideas yeah, of what it yeah. was was heavy and all that and then i got into iron maiden i got into acdc and hard so i had every, every album I, I never got into them what's that like, um, oh, you mean like um, iron maiden or I, like I, I never got into iron maiden or acdc i, I just yeah because I, I remember you saying like what is that we're talking about aha and we're talking yeah. about motley crew and stuff later yeah. on um motley crew was my um i thought motley crew when i bought it i got confused between the two albums that were sitting there it was megadeth uh, so if I said good, so what? And next to that was might be cruised off the feel good. Oh yeah, yeah. That's and it a, just and it just come out. Yeah. And so I'd actually end up going home with Dr. Feel Good. Yes. And it wasn't the one I wanted. Oh, that right? was the one I wanted. Yeah. So I yeah. had so the next day I, I had enough money. I went back and bought my Mega Yeah. So so here's Motley Crew and Mega and this is yep. my and then got A C D C and uh Iron Man. So yep. my my listening to metal, I can, I don't really have a specific light right because yep. i'm because that's my starting point then i could listen to all of that and enjoy it at any time of the day but now as you get older right yes when you're sitting down you're you know because you're so open to all the different types of music yeah you know, you're saying because you're coming like starting up and, and the other thing i forgot to mention was um queen right mm -hmm. radio gaga was one of my favorite songs and it's like so not metal it's just a nice heavy song that yeah. you play anytime and everybody like mm -hmm. sing along to grandma's there going rocking on with it and the kids out there dancing but then you go and put on metal it's like you know so how do you as an older person <laughs> go all right so <coughs> um right so i used to do metal and i used to do hard you know what you got that's group but you say metal yeah and then people go really so um for five years i worked for a uh company down in auckland and this was sort of during the the big th this was the big five years where we you know we got the album out and we did all this sort of stuff um uh oh there's 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 mike both a uh a, a loyal man if ever there was <laughs> one um and um you know, I, I always used to say, you know, I would there would be conversations that would come up and I'd be like, oh, you know, what have you got planned for the weekend? I'm actually going away on tour. Mm. They'd be like, oh, cool. What sort of music do you do? My question would always be, what sort of music do you think I do? Yeah. And I would get everything like um, hard rock, yeah. um, ACDC, um, now, hold country, on. nickel. Were you this built when you were doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so they're, so they're probably just thinking, okay, so you, you don't so have I, those I skinny, a, whiny, no, straw kid no. with long hair, so how right. could you be like doing metal? No, I, I had a, a soul patch. Yeah. Um, my hair was a little bit longer than you know what it is now. It's yeah. all slicked back with product, by the way. <laughs> it took accentuate the, the yeah. receipts. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I wore, I wore comfy shoes, I wore jeans, and I wore a yeah. T-shirt. So realistically that attire versus what yeah. my stage attire was it was from jeans to jean shorts yeah right but i would get all of these other things i even got hip-hop once mm. and i would turn to them and i'd say well no it's actually death metal yeah and then people would be like get out of here man no yeah. you're kidding it's like no i'm not you know and I'd, I'd give them a quick demonstration of of what i would actually do like what my yeah. voice sounded like and they'd be like oh my god that's yeah. wow that's crazy didn't expect that from you yeah and, and but that was the cool <laughs> thing is by us being who we were, we subverted all yeah. preconceived um, connotations that people had of us. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's like if you close your eyes and you try and picture what a what a bogan would look like. Yeah. You know, long hair, joint fag, yeah. beer, with or, or woodstock in yeah. hand. And if it's if it's blonde, it's dyed black. Yeah. You know, yeah. black jeans, Doc Martin yeah. boots. 
um but black t-shirt except i think except my hair was black with like ginger blonde um dreads yeah yeah so but that's the thing is you know when you i so i was in a very fortunate position yeah i didn't look like i belong so when yeah. we would set up on stage you were the roadies i i looked like a roadie <laughs> i would help my drummer set up yeah. and i'm putting all the symbols i'm screwing them on place yeah. but the reason so i would go to concerts or i'd go to shows and i'd kind of sit in the back and i'd just watch people and it would give me a feel for the room so i'd understand the type of people that i'm working with and um <laughs> and uh mike mike uh Ah, bless you. Watching boxing highlights, reading to the boy. Um, thanks very much. Babysitting. Mike Boda, <laughs> uh, original GC. He yeah. is currently babysitting my son, um, so I can do this with uh, Aru tonight. Yeah. Um, so going back to that is, is um, you know, and then I grabbed the microphone, and it would always just be well, he's probably just one, testing. two, three, four. Yeah. And then we would just rip into it, and yeah. a lot people that had never seen us or ever heard of us, they'd just be like. What the hell's happening yeah. here? And we would just go full bore for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, yeah. and it would just be relentless. Mm -hmm. And then we'd get off stage and I'd go back to my corner. And then I'd have people come up to me and go, oh my God, you're amazing. How do you do that with your voice? Da, yeah. da, 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 da. And it's just like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, I don't know, thanks, thanks very much. It's actually really nice. Because there is a difference vocally and about carrying your voice because i mean when if i was to just go start doing cookie monster right yeah within about 30 seconds i'm going <laughs> yeah and this is the te technical side of what you as a vocalist for death metal or metal metal in general metal in general yeah comes down to it's like even like i mean you look at um dave mustaine was getting vocal lessons mm -hmm. while he was playing guitar hard out mm -hmm. uh, there was also got uh who there's a famous female melissa cross right who was doing the metal vocalist like teaching heavy metal vocalists yeah, she had a dvd called the zen of screaming because yeah. i remember like because i was deep into like as, as a metal this is the thing like if you're into something it's not a hobby anymore and it's it's more like a lifestyle and so if you're into metal, you look at what the band's about, you look about what their past is, you know, and I, I've forgotten so much because of head injuries, but I knew what Mustaine, um, when Mustaine separated from, you know, from um, Metallica, why they did it and yeah. so on, yeah. and why I'm more passionate about Mustaine being the father of fresh metal as such, or speed metal, compared to, you know, where, um, you know, Lars and Hatfield and whatever happens. And then I'll go, but now it's like, oh, who cares? <laughs> you know, as you yeah. get older, it's like, yeah. who cares when you get yeah. up? It's like, it's just as the good thing is, you have two different bands who play great music and all that. But the other thing is, these one sings differently to the other. Yep. And um, and then there was like Melissa, right? Uh, did you say um, the Melissa name? Cross? Yeah, Melissa Cross. So she, I mean, you think that why would metals need to be getting taught how to sing? when all they get up there and do is scream. Yeah, so I I taught um, I taught vocalists. Mm. Um, and I I went to the Eastern Institute of Drama um, School uh, down in Napier. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did, uh, EIT for short, yeah. um, one of the things I did was I, I learned opera. Um, right. Opera teaches you breath control. So hold on. It, yeah, sure. Here's the thing, right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Singing, learning to sing opera, yes, and then doing the like the whole game around the opposite side of that world, yeah, yeah. and doing death metal, yes. So, what were uh, like? So, did you go in there to learn opera, or no. did you? Yes, I did. I, that was part of the curriculum. So, right, they wanted me to learn opera. I learned opera. So, so did you just go to learn vocalists or vocals, or no, did you go I, to I music actually, itself? I I went there to study drama. All right, um, to to do drama, and it was that was my big thing. So being able to dance, being able to sing, um, acting, um, you know, all of those sorts of key components make up uh, a, a good um, a person in, in the theatre. Yeah. You know, because 
let's see. So out of the 20 people in my class, absolutely none of them have anything to do yeah. with theatre or music well, that's like, nowadays. That's like my school, <clears throat> my, uh, my film school. Uh, even I don't do film anymore. But like, I'm probably the one of the ones more visually inclined to produce anything. Mm. Like, uh, I mean, comic books and so on. But yeah, like, it's it's kind of, and then also you know using script writing for movies as script writing for comic books. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of thing. But this is the weird thing about New Zealand, right? Um, the small you go in with all this passion into a institute. Mm -hmm. And you find out that only out of the 20 that meet, like I think it was about 28 people in my class, yeah. for year one, three months in, there's about 20. Uh, second year, there's about 15. Third year, there's about six. Mm. And then you get the debt on your head because of that. Yeah. How did you, like, did you go in and decide right from the start, I'm going to finish this, this is what my end result will be, and this is what I'm going to do? Because I went in there. I'm only going to do this if I can make a movie at the end of it, which I did, right? My whole thing was movie at the end of this thing. I'm going to learn everything. Is that how you did? I I fell into drama school purely out, out of just happenstance. Right. I was um, I I I I had a, a year where I was not really doing anything. Like I was mowing lawns for a living. Yeah. This um, is after the wrapping? No, no. This is this is even before I went to drama school. Right. Um, you know, I I had a year where I mowed lawns for a living. Mm. Um, I played lots of squash. Um, I taught theatre sports to kids. Yeah. I acted in a bunch of plays. Uh, I was creative musically. I did all of this kind of stuff, and then I thought, you know what? Maybe I could have. Maybe I could have a go at this. And I was yeah. uh, twenty three at the time. Yeah. And twenty three and a half. And I got in, and I thought, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a real go at this and, yeah. and see see what I can make of it." Uh, wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, actually, it was pretty average, to be fair. Walked out of there with a big debt, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of knowledge. <clears throat> yeah. Now, the good thing was I was able to parlay a lot of that knowledge into doing music because I never thought, like, if you'd have said to me, mm. you know, I mean, an opera singer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you'd have said of theater to and... thirty-two-year-old. Mark, yeah. when he's going on stage for his very first show, yeah, thirty-two-year-old Mark, it's a twenty-three-year-old well, Mark. Right. So, yeah, here we go. You're you're a middle-aged guy, like like we said, like yeah, you're you're on stage around 30, <laughs> thirty-two. Thirty-two, it's kind of the older age, yeah, right? Absolutely, metal. absolutely. Because metal, you're like about twenty-four, twenty-five, yeah. about nineteen, eighteen. So like mm -hmm. at, um, eighteen to twenty-two, when you can actually go drinking. Yep. Right? So you get your uh, band together and you go, yeah, we can go to the pubs, yep. do the thing, sing, and you'll be allowed to get in. Yep. Now, you're in the second wing of that, which is the older yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. two. So yeah. you, this is the age where you actually have a two-year-old kid and so on, and, you you know, uh, and you're set, trying to settle down, buy a house, as they say, and here you're getting on stage. Yep. Uh, and you've got a debt. So what was it like suddenly, uh, you know, realizing, okay, I got to do, got this, and like you know, I'm 50 years old. Mm -hmm. I should be actually getting home, doing stuff, why? or having a rest. But why, right? Yeah. So, what was your idea to this? Like, why should I be doing that? I should be doing more of my life. Um, I had been married. Okay. Um, my wife and I had got divorced. Right. Um, I had become very complacent when I was married. Yeah. Um, and a lot, you know, the majority of that was on me. Yeah. Um. The marriage ended because of me. Yeah. Um, and then when it ended, um, it felt like a really good opportunity for me to actually have a go at something I always wanted to do. Right. Now, I when I when I joined the band, I had three goals. Right. Make an album. Right. Make a music video. Play at the power station. Right. So just like me, I'm going to get in there, do this, do this, do this, and walk out. So the three points. Yep. And and let's look at the first one. So you're in New Zealand was, yeah. a, was another so bonus. So the well. first one was album. Yep. Got that done. Done. First year into it. So you got no, 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 not first the year. Is that your demo or third no? Year? So so we we did. Uh, so the first year when we were writing, we didn't actually release any material. Yep. Probably the second or third year we were together. Um, yep. We released a demo called Bleeding the Horror Inside. Um, great title. 
Yeah. Um, and then a couple of years after Very that. Very good. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Um, uh, and then, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine it's like when you bleed the horror inside, I'm thinking all this blood coming in from inside you, you well, know, like freaking yeah, aliens pouring out there. But bleeding the horror inside was about essentially suffering through your own pain, right? Yourself, you know, when you're let's say a, a relationship breakup, yeah, that's really hard and really devastating, right? You, a lot of people don't. Been can't, there, can't share it. done that exactly, and so so that's the horror that is yeah. inside, right? Yeah, um, um, we then released our our first proper album, and that album was called No Fear of Consequences, right? Um, and it was that was um, I think we'd been together for about four and a half, five years at that point. Yeah, um, but that that was the that was the big one, right? And so that was the big one that had the music video attached to it. That had the tours and. Um, that had the um, the international support slot as well. Now that's your first album. Uh, yeah. Four years in. Mm. Uh, done. Had your dues. Yes. Had your own the demo. Now was this the one that they had the video video that you did yourselves? Yep. Right. So what was the song in that one? It's the song for the music video was called Switch. Switch. Yep. All right. So now this, how well did it, was it received? Um, actually, surprisingly well. Um, it wasn't. Like if I was to think about that that first proper album, we had the first song, which was Darkest Green. That Darkest Green was the very first song I ever wrote lyrics for. It was the song that was picked by the um, the rock to put together as part of a metal compilation to raise funds, uh, ready to rumble. Yeah. Um, which was to raise funds for the Christchurch earthquake. Right. Um, so we so this is around right about what, 2010, right? Give or take, yeah. No. So then we went from there. So Switch was essentially the the second single, right? If you like, um, that was the second single. Um, it got the music video treatment because I was able to get hold of uh, a friend who was a rep for Sony, who was able to get me some gear that yeah. didn't charge me. So I think it cost us the tapes because we yeah. had tape decks, uh, DV tapes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I DV, used them on yeah, so many, many DV tapes, man. Yeah, they're just so funny. You know what? The other day I saw a twenty-five dollar HDD camera. Yeah, and they used to be cost around a thousand bucks. Yeah, they did. And, and I wanted one of those. Like it was, I think they came out when I was at film school in two thousand four, and we're, like the tapes you're talking about, we were, we were yeah. using DV uh, DV tapes because we said we were told they're like like analog for music. That yeah. It, you as long as it's on hard copy you can't lose it because once you go digital you know your uh your um the, the changes to um i think they were saying like the players like you, it might switch so quickly the apps could switch so, so quickly and you lose your music i talked to somebody about how digital music has been um oh gosh I can't, um, no i actually listened to a documentary by Shellac, the, um, the lead um, guy from Shellac, mm -hmm. and he was teaching in Sydney to a you know, high school, or like a school, music school, and he was talking why they started going back into albums. Yep. Why they're going back to uh, uh, analog, and we're getting a bit more production wise here. Or vinyl. So, vinyl. Or vinyl. Why yep. go to vinyl? vinyl? Because like it's there, and so it's not on a on a uh, on on a USB drive that could be lost, or it's on a you know, it's on a um, no longer functioning hard hardware player yep. for that thing. Like, I mean, we, there was a thing called Zoom by. Oh um, God, that was terrible. Know, right? Yeah. So horrific uh, player. Right, and so nobody, and you know, and the yeah. reason I remember that, like, somebody was talking about on a podcast yeah, yesterday, Zoom, yeah, and how nobody, you know, no. it didn't work, and so iPods would just suddenly just took off, and they were like, oh, it's because it's more acceptable, you know, work, you know. It was more nicely designed and stuff. It's like, well, they were doing the same thing, but one didn't work. So analog's coming to a point where, like, you know, we need to get back to the vinyl. Mm. And it's not because, in a sense, that it's something that you can actually hold in your hand, which is great. You know, it's like oh, comics. Yeah. Yeah. You can have an actual visual medium in your hand. But then digital is like, so you could lose it so easily. And, and um, so you guys got an album together. Yes. Now, was it on, as a CD or was it as an album? Uh, uh, vinyl, uh, so it was city only. Okay. Uh, city also with digital downloads. Cool. So, 
this one is this the same one that you we talked about earlier about you self published um yep. recording now so you recorded all that for um, under a thousand dollars yeah you got uh, a video yes we got switch out there you actually got on compilation for yep for the Christchurch. Mm -hmm. um next step what was the next thing after that uh, next or well, kind of the next thing that happened to us was uh, an international support slot mm. um we'd always wanted to play the power station for us as a band it's kind of the the icon place yeah you know been there if, a few times yeah yeah, yeah same i mean i think it's some of my most right? amazing shows at the power station um you know i've seen fair factory i've seen she Hard more times than i care to remember yeah um i've seen cora I've seen some just absolutely phenomenal bands mm -hmm. at the power station, uh, Lamb of God, um, you know. So you, as a as a metal musician mm -hmm. or even as a rock musician, it was it was always kind of the the beacon. Right. You could tell, you could benchmark yourself as a band. We played. To, yeah, I yeah. played. Yeah. At the power station. Right. And that was the big thing, right? Um, we got offered a support slot with um, Whitechapel and Trivium. Yep. And um, there were two other New Zealand metal bands opening up, and we got a 20 minute slot. 20 minutes. And this is what, 2011, <coughs> 2010? Give it a take, yeah. And um, 20, 20, or oh, no, 20, yeah, 2010, 2011. And. Um, we took it, we had 20 minutes, we packed our four tightest songs in there because mm -hmm. we didn't even end up getting 20 minutes. Yeah. We ended up getting 15. And we packed four songs in there. Yeah. And we just, like, we had no room on stage because there was, like, there was Trivium's gear right at the back of the line. Yeah. Then you had Whitechapel's. And then you had, who else was it? It was... Um, uh, subtract, and then you had set on end, and then us. So we're on stage with very limited space. Um, we actually have to start playing before the doors even open, yeah, if we want to get us set, right? So we start the doors open, people are running in. By the time we're done, shh, uh, <laughs> I'll mic voter there, mm. um, you know we've got 15 minutes to make people know who we are now we, we had a very cheap tactic yeah um our, our whole album cost a thousand dollars right 500 copies yeah that night i and i remember this so clearly we played our set there's about 400 people on the floor some on the balcony and i said we're fractured with the free shit check us out and i just started firing cds out willy-nilly yeah and that was it we got off stage and then the funny thing about that was we, we, we were rushed off stage. We ran yeah. down back. We packed all our gear into the car. We came back inside. Yeah. And then I watched Whitechapel. I'd never heard Whitechapel before. Yeah. Now, Whitechapel are uh, one of the original deathcore bands, which is one of those subgenres we were talking about. Yeah. And um, I, I went down outside. I went outside afterwards, and they were packing out. And I remember standing there and I was having a conversation with a dude that I thought was a roadie. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that, that band, White Chapel, how does that guy do it? His voice is just so low. Yeah. It's like a snake's ass dragging on the ground. Yeah. And the guy who was just standing the other side of yeah. me, I was talking to this side and this guy here, he was like, oh, thanks, man. That's a really cool compliment. <laughs> I was like, oh. I was like, dude. Yeah. He goes, yeah. I was like, how do you do it? And, you know that that then led to me exploring things vocally as well. Yeah, you know, and going back to your, um, like Oprah Roots, Oprah Roots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank because you know, yeah, because that that teaches you about how to use your diaphragm, where to place your voice, breath control, mm. all of those sorts of things, which are surprisingly keen. I mean, I I would you know when we were doing our weekend tours away, there was not one show that I didn't go to where I didn't have someone come up to me and go, "Bro, I can scream longer than you." Yeah. I'd be like, "All right then." Yeah. Let's yeah. give it this a whirl, shall we? Well, isn't it the isn't it the Kiwi thing though? Ah, uh, yeah. And, and here's the thing: like a lot of people like uh, say, well, you know that, um, and, and geek culture, right? Yeah. Like people think that it's it's only in geek culture you've got to prove yourself as a fan. No. 
and, and they think, well, okay, you know who's who, what's what, oh, yeah. right on yeah. this. And if, and it's like, no, you shouldn't challenge me because, you know, I am a fan. It's like, dude, you get in anything you, you become part of. If you go, well, I'm into Megadeth, yep. name a couple songs. Right? Yeah. When, you know, what's the Alice album? Oh, well, give us a, you know, sing us a lyrics. And it's like, that's normal part of being a part of a cultural thing or like a group. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. But you look at, um, you look at metal appropriation. Mm. I and mean, how many times have you seen Kendall Jenner wear a Metallica t-shirt? <laughs> Dude, that was, there was That's one. Hilarious. Who was it like the, uh, but that was a weird thing. So I saw a video where an audience member goes, uh, so you're into Metallica. Yeah, name two songs. They tell no, you what, no, name no, just one no, song. she goes, oh, what? She goes, the t-shirt you're wearing. Yeah. She, totally on live on stage, yeah, got bummed yeah. out because it was yeah. just, yeah, it's just because of lots of cool t-shirts. Yeah. Like, yeah, but that's sort of like um, I think for all, in, in you know in my space in geekdom, so in the pop culture, it's like yeah, we don't actually just wear it because it's because you know for fun of it, mm. it's because we're into it. It's like kids, kids don't wear something just because they're it's fun. It's because they associate themselves. Like, why does a kid knows what Spider Man is, right? So yeah, I mean my son, yeah. um, big Marvel fan. Um, you know, he's got the favorite characters that he likes, right? Yeah. Um, but he likes those characters for those reasons. So when it's clothes shopping time for him, if he sees an Avengers t-shirt, yeah. if he sees a, um, you know, a Thor or yeah. a Hulk t-shirt, you know, that, that's, that's where he leans towards. And you, right. you, you like what you like. You, yeah. often, sometimes you don't know why, but you just like it. But yeah. that's like you were a Megadeth fan, right? Right. Okay. I was an Anthrax fan. Right. right? So same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like four the the four classic Titan bands, yeah. right? Slayer, Megadeth, uh, Megadeth, and uh, Metallica. Sorry, Slayer, Anthrax, Megadeth, Metallica. Am I right? Slayer, Anthrax, Megadeth, Megadeth Metallica. Yeah, yeah, the big four. The big four. The big right. fours of thrash. The thrash Titans. You know, I I never got into Slayer. Slayer yeah. was just. I came into Slayer later. Yeah, so I yeah. I got maybe into like maybe I got into Slayer around later. Divine Intervention. That was the album that yeah. broke me in. Yeah. Um, Ditto Head's Wait, an amazing song. South of Heaven got me in. Oh, that's an early one. Okay. Yeah, it was like, I think it was like, uh, it was it was an early album, but it was actually... You heard it later day, on. Decades or so later. Yeah. It was because of the, uh, I think, I think it was like South of the, the opening riff. Mm. Right? And I was like, that's what gets me with metal when it comes to metal. If you can get me a riff that is so unique and melodic, yeah, rhythmic. It just grabs me in, and like you were talking about one, right? Yeah, just how heavy it was, and something like walk. You know, um, I can remember it in my head. I can hear this song in my head, but I can't mouth it out or you know vocalize it. But the whole um, the walk, um, and so it's like plush. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even Nirvana's song. So uh, with um, Teen Spirit. So if you can grab, I'm getting to where I want to say with you with the music that you're doing. That's two opening, like, you know, riffs. How do you, when you go to write a song, mm. how do you decide this is what the intro has to be to bring everybody into what the story you're going to tell with the music? Um, there was, who was it? There was a band called Chimera. Yeah. Um, I really like Chimera. I still do to this day. Yeah. Um, they, they had they released their first album which was called pass out of existence right major label big production values they thought it was going to do really really well it ended up just sucking really really hard right um they wrote their second album the impossibility of reason for the six members of the band right and anyone else that liked it was a bonus right that was the stance we took right we we wrote all our music for us we didn't write it for anyone else right so uh, you know, as we as we moved on through our songwriting, mm. you know, we started incorporating um, other styles of music into it. Yeah. Um, you know, because your influences start broadening, you start listening to more, so mm. that naturally creeps into the songwriting um, process. Um, <laughs> like my guitarist, um, who was one of the main songwriters, he um, was a big Mastodon fan. Um, I was, I, mean, I was never. Most of them's the one with the more uh, rhythm and heavy tones, isn't it? It's, a lot of odd like times, a, a lot of odd time signatures. Yeah. Definitely a lot of groove. You've got, it's a four piece band and three of them sing. 
Right. Um, the drummer, the bassist, and one of the guitarists. Yeah. Um, but I was never really into Mastodon. So when we, when it came time for us to do our second album, we had a song that was very Mastodon-ish. Yeah. Um, so I, and, and I could never write lyrics for it. Yeah. It was just one of those songs where I was just like, I don't like it. Yeah. Where I was outvoted. So I was like, all right, cool. So I'm, I'm in the studio. We've cut nine or eight songs mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and then there's this last one to go. So I sit down and I write lyrics on the spot. Right. Never done that before in my entire life. Yeah. I sit down, I write write lyrics on the spot, and um, they'd given the song a title, and they were really, really stoked with themselves yeah. because up until that point, I'd named all the songs, I'd written all the lyrics. Yeah. That was all. It was all on me. Um, they'd given it this name title, and they really wanted to have it. And the and the song. And the song. Right. All right. And they wanted the song to be called that. And the song title was Cock Puncher. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, sure. It's, it's, that it's, is what it's, it is. It's very radio friendly. Yeah, it is. You know, it's yeah. it's easy, easily going to be the the lead single. Yeah. Um, but I wrote. I was like, well, you know, how hard can it be to write like Mastodon? Yeah. So I, I wrote down a song like Mastodon, and I essentially made that song about um, demasculating. Yeah, because I was like, well, let's take a literal sense of it. Mm. You know, let's take a chick punching a guy in the car and then you is, the thing about that is the pain right so you can actually which yeah. so what was the, like that's your like your overall subject yeah what's the theme that you came across with that so song? i broke the song down into three parts i yeah. broke it down into um the the male part being demasculated yeah. i then broke it down into the part of the female and then i broke it down into the part of the guy where he's like um you know, um, th this is who he is now. You know, and um, it was it was always a sort of very much a funny song because right. you know, yeah. well, the title's a funny song, right? Well, yeah, because yeah, I mean, we very we, punk. So all of our song titles actually. So a, a traditional thing in songwriting is that you have the title of the song in the song yeah. somewhere, right? right. AC is back and blank. Whereas, whereas like ma metal doesn't do that. Like it's one. Yes right? and no. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. Some bands do it. Some True. some don't. Yeah. I never did it. So yeah. obviously the the subject is now songwriting. So I'm going to yeah. share something really really interesting with you. Cool. Um. So you talked about Pearl Jam before, right? Right. Okay. Eddie Vedder was my sole yeah. inspiration for writing lyrics and his style. Yeah. Um. The song Jeremy. Yeah. Being the absolute specific one. Right. Um, if you if you were to read the lyrics for Jeremy, yeah. it's very very interesting. It's not a rhyming structure, no. and traditional metal and modern metal, it, it rhymes. You know, it, it's yeah. like um, it, it it's, it's it's read like poetry. Yeah, but it, you know, it's like you know, time, dime, shine, all yeah. these sorts of things. Um, the lyrics for Jeremy are at home, drawing yeah. pictures of mountaintops with him on top, yeah. a lemon yellow sun. Arms I used to, to be. Yeah, but what I used to scream that out like that whole thing. I used to blast my um, stereo, and I'd be singing to that when yeah. we were doing our band. Yeah. So it was like me training myself to other people's vocals, mm. and so you're writing it. So you're saying, like, with you lyric wise, you're not rhyming in your. No, no, there was never any rhyming. Uh, what the song Jeremy taught me is, mm. is you can write and create an image in people's minds i mean that's a very image. and it's a much more yeah. powerful thing yeah. that to me it was infinitely more powerful than going dime time shine yeah sign those sorts of things you know, you where you essentially try and force a rhyming scheme in there mm. i wanted to create something in people's heads right. i'll give you an example yeah. yeah yeah we we had a song called land of the slaughter yeah um the title came from an old Roald Dahl short story. Okay. Okay. Great short story. Um, and it was a, a very, you know, we wrote a very cool song. Yeah. A very groove based, very Pantera. Yeah. Pantera esque, right? Um, I I wrote the lyrics for pretty much everything. Um, so the I remember. So this is this is how well I remember. It. I'd written the song, and then we'd had practice on the Thursday, and then I'd written the song over the weekend. And we had it on the Tuesday. Right. Um. I go there and the guy's like, well, have you, have you got the song? And I was like, right. yeah, yeah, I've got some lyrics. I was like, cool. Okay, we'll, we'll go through and do it. 
So we get to it, it's like da 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 We get to the chorus, and the first line of the chorus is, I will devour all your hope. Right. Uh, was Rather it, dark. I was just thinking, like, give up all, or give up hope, all who enter here. Yeah. yeah. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Yeah. yeah. I will devour all your hope. And I remember that everyone, my guitarist, he just stopped, and he was just like, wait. What? What, what did you just say? Yeah. And I told him the line, he goes, okay, that's really dark, man. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I will devour all your hope. I am here to show you the way. Right. Um, a path to find your inner self. Right. Um, I can't remember the, the fourth line after it. But, it, you know, yeah. it was, it was as soon as you said that lyric, yeah. there was an image that just popped into your head. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm saying, like, just... give up all hope, I've been in all hope, <laughs> it's like, yeah, boom. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, you're right, it, I mean, it does create a, a dark image, but it's also a beautiful image. Mm. Like, you could say, well, it's just a friggin' huge yeah. ocean in front of you, or yep. you can go, oh, it's an all night in front of you. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. So, I mean, like, when you were talking about, you know, writing lyrics and yes. trying to form an idea and and you're telling a story yeah so what was the story all behind that one you know it's behind land of the slaughter yeah um the story behind it was that it was about someone that was being misguided or misled um essentially um stockholm syndrome yeah um those yeah. sorts of Cultic. things yeah, yeah yeah cult type uh having a mm. cult type following mm. um you know it's it's really one of those things where you can twist and manipulate people right um, you know, I will devour all your hope. That's me as a cult leader yeah, breaking just, you down. Right. But I am yeah, here yeah, to show you the again. way. Yeah. I will show you the path. Yeah. Um, now, I, 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 I always found that interesting because as the, the years have gone on, yeah. we've learned more about cults and those sorts of yeah. things. Um, the, the most recent one I can think of is Nexium with Keith Ranieri, who had the, I guess, sex cult. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he did the same thing. He he brought people down to build yeah. them back up into this, I, I, what, what I, he um, wanted. I remember, like, um, reading books on cults. And, yeah. And I just thought, I'd make a great cult leader. And I use that, like, in, you know, just a humor thing. But, yeah. I mean, it is so easy to knock down people's hopes and desires when they're already hoped when they're already knocked down and yeah yeah, yeah, and just yeah. Come along and go, yeah you know i see how you uh, and here's what we're going to do but when you're going to make your like on us more and it's like abuse systems right when yep. you, when you're like in a uh, in a in a uh relationship where you get domestic violence it's like the person keeps going back to the abuser over and mm -hmm. over and go why can't you not and so like, because that one abuser is basically telling them i'm it you're never going to find anybody else. Uh, no? Yeah, I, it's not something that I've ever experienced firsthand, so I have no comment yeah. on it. But all, all I can say is mm. that when, when you have the abuser abusee relationship, yeah. the abuser says, You cannot live without me, you will be nothing without me. Right. So the abusee tends to. And, say and, that. and then just like a cult, they cut off all their friends. Yep. And it's kind of. So. There is your there is a story, right? So it's yeah. like, give up all hope. I'm gonna build you up, mm -hmm. and then where are you going with the ending? So like, you know, you got your middle part. I'm gonna build you up. Yep. You got your starting. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm gonna take it all away. Mm -hmm. So you uh, and you know, I mean, as a as a writer, you're not gonna like go. Well, I'm gonna just leave you in depression, you know, because you're thinking about oh, this guy's taking away all your hope in the song. Because I mean, what's the point of writing a song if you're not gonna have you know the ending to bring it all together so well, how did you bring it all together in that uh, why does it have to have a happy ending right so how did you decide how it's going to work uh each song if, if it's someone have it be ending each song like it doesn't have to but i mean yeah. each song, each has, song to have has, a, has a resolution right uh, and, and it really depends on the sort um you know it, it's it's you can have either a positive or negative. Most people prefer positive, but then you look at a film like Natural Born Killers. Yeah, it's the baddies I mean, win. Yeah. And 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 in in film, and I I love movies, I love yeah. TV shows. Very rarely do you see the bad guy win. Right. right? Um, it's it's always they're they're always defeated and yeah. good triumphs over evil. But it doesn't actually necessarily have to be well, that way. It doesn't happen in reality either. No. Yeah. So, oh, we have a question. Yeah, I'm going to pop that up in a sec. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, so that song, 
the resolution was the person just stayed in the cult. Right? We don't, we never found out what happened to them afterwards. Mm. Um, you know, it, it was just like they became part of it. Yeah, yeah. They, they became and, one of the children, and then the the ch then that children now goes and does the same to them. You know, yeah. brings them all flock in. It's right. it's kind of um, what was like. What made you think to write about a cult? I didn't, but it came. It, out it that just way. started out that way. Um, there's specific songs that I've written along the way which have been very specifically themed. Yeah. Um, I wrote a song called "Failure of Natural Selection." Um, which yeah. was always actually was a very popular song to play um, live. Yeah, we we that song is um, about a guy in one of the Eastern European countries who was posting videos on YouTube about how he was Darwin's natural selector and yeah. all of these sorts of very dark things. And he did go on a very horrific. Um, spree killing, and it was just uh, absolutely abhorrent what he did. Oh, you about the Norfolk? Um Norwegian? Um, maybe. I, I, yeah. it's, it, this is, it's so long ago, but, but I wrote it from three perspectives. Right. I wrote it from his perspective, yeah. the police chiefs investigating a perspective, yeah. and then the general public's perspective. Right. Um, so to write a song based around three perspectives, but all with one overarching yeah. thing to it, um, was a lot of fun. It was actually it was a song that was the hardest I've ever had to write. It took right. me probably about three months so you got just going to it, coming back, going to it, coming back. Put on three different point of views. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of like uh, Slayer's, you know, um, Death Skin Mask, based off... Um, Angel of Death. Yeah, Angel of Death. Um, yeah. Really dark stuff, but the music sort of doesn't... Um, there's this thing about, like, I mean, even though, like, you know, we're talking about, like, death metal and stuff like that, mm. and death core and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not depressing music once you're actually in it as much. I, I mean, some people might find, like, I mean, like in everything, there's going to be a percentage that actually finds the darkness in it all and becomes, takes that darkness within. There are those, you know, um, that actually just enjoyed for the music, right? Yep. And so um, how do you, I mean, like as, as a musician who's yep. writing that sort of music, how yep. do you go, well, the whole idea of responsibility of the music and art, I don't understand, like, um, because we have that, we deal with it a lot in like comics and stuff like yep. that, and manga. Yep. It's like, oh, you got to be responsible for your art, you got to self censor, or you got to have somebody else censor it. Did you ever feel like you needed to censor with your writing? No, because, um, you know, I, I wrote personal things about what was going on with me yep. um, in my life. So I, you know, um, I wrote about a relationship breakup. Um, uh, I wrote about people judging me and telling me I'm never going to amount to anything. Mm -hmm. I wrote about my inner demons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wrote about, you know, that, that really, you know, if, let's say you're in a long relationship and it ends and then you go to start a new relationship and then suddenly yeah. that, that old relationship just keeps coming back into your mind. I wrote that perspective. Yeah. But then I wrote about things like, this dude who thought he was a natural selector yeah. and cults, but then I wrote a song which actually means nothing. Right. It's just a bunch of sentences that I really, really liked, and I put them all together in a song. Just a bit of poetry. Yeah, essentially, that's what it is. Was it like I was thinking of a song that just when you said guy thinks about um, you know something tells him it means like nothing. It's like my father always told me you'll never amount to nothing. Mm. I, I, I can't remember what song that's from, and you know it's kind of. Yeah, it's a metal song, and you think you're like, well, at the end of it, like, I, I just find like the um, the great thing about metal is that having the uniqueness of so many different talent genres. Yeah, you know, you look at death metal having inspired the whole uh, European movement. You know, was it like Norwegian? Um, well, you've got you've got black metal, for example, right? Yeah, that's okay. It, that's now, it. now black yeah. metal came about because. Well, hold on. Before we get to that, yes, let's get to these questions. So, okay, we have two then questions. we can move into the black metal. So, uh, Monique wants to ask, what do you think of the mainstream songwriting these days? Um, now, 
I, if, if you're referring to metal, let's hit that one. Let's go with the metal. Okay. Mainstream metal, right? Ma okay. Well, so we'll break it down into two parts, Monique. We'll talk about, first one, we'll talk about mainstream men, mm -hmm. then we'll talk about music in general, okay. right? The, the, the wider music scope. Yeah. Um, in metal music, um, I think now you've got a lot of bands that are taking that, you know, they've grown up with so many different genres. They're pulling bits and pieces mm -hmm. from different mm -hmm. genres into their style of music. It's a metalcore thing. Um, no, there, uh, there's bands like uh, 12 Foot Ninja. Um, um, they're an Australian band. They're yeah. really, really good. Um, they will have, in one song, they might go from um, acoustic yeah. through to gent, which is another type of metal, yeah. through to reggae, through to a bit of dubstep, yeah. and that's one song. You know, but then, then you've got bands like um, Bloody Wood, the Indian metal guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they're they're taking a lot of their native <laughs> instruments and they're putting it into metal, and that's that's really it's, cool. It's really that's funny. amazing. Uh, it's really funny. Which I mean, I've seen. Uh, I, I think I hit them up through Patreon when I joined Patreon. I was like, "What are these guys?" Yeah. And then, like, I, I you know, I got the album. Um, you know, and this is a cool thing. The only thing about Patreon, right? You could actually create. And I, I had a discussion today with um, game creators. Uh, it was a yeah, local game creator, and um, just saying like how amazing this gen uh, generation is that technically you could create your thing and put it out to the world and yep. then somebody will actually finance it because yep. they love it yep. and without you having to deal with a manager or i mean like not a manager like an agent without a corporate a corporate um recording which we're, we're going to get we'll, we'll so. get into we'll talk about yeah. labels and management and all that sort of uh, stuff but so later. So mainstream songwriting nowadays and metal in term like mm -hmm. there's just there's so much more variety um you know when I was growing up, I, you know, I, I had my, my styles of music and, you know, it was all very, these are my styles yeah. and I will not deviate too much from this path. But then my son, okay. um, you know, he loves Take On Me. Yeah. Um, he likes a bit of Skrillex. Yeah. Um, he loved Baby Metal, for example. I was going to talk about Baby that. Baby Metal, See, very because, cool. Because um, it was in my head. I couldn't <coughs> remember the name of it because when you said Ninja and you said all these different things, mixes. Yeah. And... And it is like that. Baby metal is a bit like that with a whole bunch of different bands. There's another one called Band Made, uh, and and they're all and they're all maids and out of like they dress up as maids. And um, oh, there's ghosts. Six, and there's ghosts. No, yeah. there's ghosts. Though, um that's like supposedly satanic, but they sing like seventies rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somebody, I was like, somebody was playing it the other day, and I was like. Oh no, I think it was Mike I was playing the other day. I was like, I know these all these songs and that it's ghost. I was like, What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like wait, this is like hard rock. So but the good that but that's the yeah. good thing nowadays is you've got bands like Greta Van Fleet who are calling back to Led Zeppelin and they wear right. their influence, influences proudly on their sleeve. You've got bands that are modern thrash bands that are calling back to the likes of Overkill, Early Testament. Ginger? Um, ginger sort of falls in, kind of. Well, falls see, that. Ginger are interesting because um, uh, the lead singer, whose name I can't pronounce, I'm very sorry, um, yeah. she can do the beautiful, clean, wispy vocals, and then she can just transition yeah. into a growl just so easily. Um, but, you know, you've got bands that are now taking different genres and even, even looking at like um, bands like Genesis and yeah. Pink Floyd where they use, um, you know, if we're talking musicality, we're talking odd time signatures and stuff yeah. like that, they're putting that in there. But then, you know, um, you've got all of these other bands that throw, that take other genres in the metal genre, yeah. and then they go, okay, cool, well, let's do this, and then let's sound like that. But then you have some genres that'll just focus so insularly yeah. on one thing. Right. Sugar created the style of music that we now know as Gent, right? right. D-J-E-N-T. But then you've got a million other bands that are suddenly like, oh, yep, yeah, let's just play that open, that do 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 odd, odd time signature, yeah. you know, and let's just have the, the drums be all syncopated and meet up in the middle. Um, yeah. You know, bands like uh, Periphery, Architects, um, that's kind of, you know, where, where they all started and they've all moved away from them. Um, so I think um it, mainstream songwriting these days is, is 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 very broad and expansive but in terms of modern music in general wow so i have a <laughs> so i i will yeah <clears throat> i i just don't comment on it 
<laughs> but carry on. So yes and no. Right. I, I don't have a problem with some modern music. Yeah. I have always preferred an artist who writes their own music. Yeah, like, that's what that that's yeah. that's the big thing. Um, I've always also appreciated an artist more that plays their own music. Yeah. Right. So yes. There is a passion to it, like you know, yet, like we're talking about like um Lamb Lamb to Slaughter. Yeah. There was a passion to the fact that you wrote those lyrics, yeah. your band played it, and yeah. you get up there and you're doing it. Yep. Yeah. And when somebody says what's that about, you go, This is what's about. Yeah. And then if you're playing like I think it was like was it somebody else wrote Like a Virgin? It was a dude who wrote it like a virgin or something yeah, for Madonna. Yeah. yeah. And you go, how do you explain that to, you know, but he's writing like a virgin for, as a guy. Yeah. And Madonna singing as a girl. Well, and it's like, you know, you, you, know, you take a look at all these recording um, machines. Right. Um, um, Dr. Luke Gottlieb, um, who wrote a lot of Katy Perry, a yeah. lot of Keisha music. Um, they specifically write pop songs because right. they have a formula it works really well they write pop songs right now <clears throat> as an uh, you you're an artist to a certain extent mm. um but you're also produced in such a way where it's like hey we need you to pitch this word here yeah. this next word here and here and you can do this and you, your, your scope of being a truly creative artist it, it can be limited well, it's, because you're part of a bigger machine it's kind of what people do look at when they do look at digital. It's like I'm a digital art. I'm like, it takes me just as long. Yeah, um, <laughs> my I, my eyes and my fingers do the same thing that yeah. I would do with a paintbrush, but I do it cleaner because I'm using digital. Yeah, and, and there's a reason why I do it. But it, it's the balance between machine and man, right? I mean, producing music and art. I mean, can a mach machine produce art? So Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails came up with a really good piece to speak about that. Yeah. Is that he doesn't use machines as a crutch. They are just simply an extension of the art he wishes to create. Right. Um, industrial so, metal. So That's the other thing I forgot to say. I was into industrial metal. Right? <coughs> so the likes yeah. of Billie Eilish, Lord, New Zealand's own Lord. Yeah. Um, they are artists who... I mean, Billie Eilish worked with her brother. Yeah. They produced um, that, that big single, Bad Guy, mm. which was, is actually a great track. I actually think it's quite catchy. Mm. Um, very unique and original. And when Lord did Royals, her and Joel Little, yeah. now Joel Little's background is in pop punk. He yeah. was, uh, was it um, Good Night Nurse? Yeah. Um, so, you know, he brings an understanding of how to write a tune and stuff yeah. like that. But you know, essentially, Lord, Lord did a lot of the heavy lifting on that one. The funny thing about Lord and that Royal song, I didn't because I don't listen to radio, right? Yeah, I have, I have, like, I don't even remember. I like the only time I ever get to listen to radio mm -hmm. is when someone's actually putting it on the cut. Yeah, and I'm with them, and so otherwise, I just listen to my my music mm -hmm. that's on my pod, um, like on my phone or on my on YouTube. So. My brother wrote a friggin' song in Hindi to Lord. Okay. And uh, to, the, to Royals. Mm -hmm. And he put it online. And I was like, this is so funny, man. This is just so funny. What the hell? It's about Indians with their gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and, um, and but it was made culturally uh, specific. Yeah. yeah. And it was a Puki, uh, not Puki, Papakura. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Papakura because, he, you know, he's, all our families are like the things right there and all that. But I mean, because Such it's like. Noodle mouse. Yeah. So it's like. And I'm like, that's my first time to Lord. He goes, no, 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 dude, 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 dude. this is actually a freaking proper song by a Kiwi. I'm like, yeah, let's check it out. I was like, straight away, it's called. I was like, mm. this, and like, it was like so different from what was coming out of New Zealand. Yeah. And it was, I think, would that, would that Lord um, Royals be Nirvana's team spirit? Well, it's interesting because it did really, but that's an amazing question. Because but really generation because, wise, because you yeah. look at what came after that, yeah. you look at all of these artists that started doing real minimalistic stuff. Yeah. The game um, changed. It, it really because it was yeah. just so so obscure from what the norm was of what any everyone else yeah. was doing. Um, you know, it, it took off in such a big way. So, to an extent, yes, because it well, hasn't she was playing stadiums. Because it, but it yeah. hasn't created an entire sub-genre right it's it's it let, let a change in, in pop music revolution in terms yeah. of less can be more but it didn't create its own counterculture well the minimalism who's the other kiwi guy who did um 
the song for I think Game of Thrones or something, and also for um, oh gosh, was it um, Lord of the Rings, the redhead guy? Um, anyway, um, Kiri redhead, I think it was. Oh, and it was like it reminds me like him coming after Lord, yeah, and that sort of minimalism. So we've gone right, right, wrong, um, round way around mainstream. So back to like the um, Trent Reznor thing, yeah. The, um, the t- uh, what is it like the industry? Uh, what the, the, um, the instrument is the extension of his music, yeah, or something like that. So, I mean, and so industrial metal is something we haven't talked about, no. And so, when I remember like industrial metal was like I'd go past Massport mowers in Auckland or Cannery, yep. like on Penmure, uh, on Mount Langdon Highway, but doom, 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 mm-hmm. doom. Yeah. and you think like Cynica, you know, anything. And then, so, did you ever, I mean, like, you guys are four-piece uh, music, uh, instrumental band. you got bass. Two guitars. Two guitars and drums. I'm going to sing so five-piece. Did you any, <clears throat> decide to bring any other instrument into that? Before no. Before we Okay, so just no. core. Yeah, we're all musicians. Metal. We all play. Pure metal. Pure metal. That's it. Okay, so I've got one more question here, and then we'll move on to, uh, I think it was back. Let's go to recording after this. Yeah, cool. All right. So this is after being fully immersed in the music. Was it hard to walk away, and will you go back? Good question. That's a big question. Um, once you have the, you know, it, okay, it, it, it it's actually a, a quite a wider question in general because it's once you've been fully immersed in music. The, the bigger question is once you've been fully immersed in performing, right? Because you know the the buzz you get from being on stage yeah. and performing a play versus the buzz you get from being on stage and performing your own music those they're, they're a very similar yeah. buzz it's, it's very it's, very similar it's that connection to the audience it, it is and you can <clears throat> and that's something like i want to go into that after this with um movie soundtracks yeah yeah um you know yes was it hard to walk away yes and no Yes, it was hard to walk away because we had signed with a label. We were just starting to do some really cool stuff management-wise. Um, you know, we'd played uh, a really cool festival down in Wellington, and it was it was good. Um, I was a, a new dad. Um, my son was... By the time the band split, my son was one and a half. Mm. Um, my other guitarist, he also had a child. My other guitarist, he had two kids. Um, you know, we, we were dads. I mean, you guys were full-time working. Yeah, yeah. We and were got kids. working full-time, being dads, trying to fit music in there as well. Something was eventually bound to break. Um, mm. Will I go back to music? I still play music at home. I still have a guitar. I still write. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love mean, that side you're, of things. You're an artist, right? Yeah, so well, an yeah, artist doesn't exactly. put down the pen. No. Or pencil. No. Paintbrush. You, well, you don't put down the creativity. Yeah. The creativity doesn't just suddenly stop and dry up. Um, you know, for me, when I moved to Whangarei, um, I, I was asked quite early on in the piece if I'd like to join the theatre because of my background in drama. Right. Um, I was asked if I'd like to do some music stuff because of my background in music. Yeah. Um, at the time, I was focused on being the best father I could be, making yeah. sure I was there for my son to help him through his formative years. Right. You know? Um, so... At that time, the answer was no, because a theatre schedule, when you're getting ready for a play, you're often doing... Got like, Saturdays, Sundays, well, uh, no, practices, even Even, even the rehearsals, even yeah. the rehearsals during the weekdays. Yeah. And when you're, when you're like, say, myself and my son's mum, when we do week on, week off, you know, it's great for the weeks that I don't have him, but the weeks I do have him, I kind of want to have that time with him. Yeah. You know, I, want to, I want to spend time with him. I want yeah. to bond. Um, you know... Um, so I, I couldn't commit to theater in that way. Yeah. I couldn't commit to music in that way because you, you, you rehearse yeah. and you rehearse so you can play shows and play shows. So you can theoretically earn money, even for metal, but yeah. you know, um, that, that was kind of how it was. Son's a lot older now. Yeah. Um, he turned nine last month. A bit more understanding. A bit more understanding. And, and yeah. you know, he's starting to explore himself and figure out who he is as a person as well. Yeah. So that gives me a lot of free time to do things like this because yep. I've got a support network. I've got a wonderful, wonderful mate yep. who, um, you know, who was babysitting my son tonight. So we can 
do these sorts of things. Yeah. So I can now start doing these sorts of things right. and I can start look at being a bit more creative. Will I jump on stage again? Possibly, possibly not. Mm. Uh, I have, uh, even pre-drama school, mm. I had an interest in filmmaking. Right. And so for me, I think that's where the next stage of my my right. creative so journey is. So filmmaking, you, photography, those sorts of things. I think you'll be behind the camera or editing? Behind the, the camera, um, directing. I, I enjoy yeah. working with people because I have an understanding of actors and what they yeah. need to help with well, roles. That's the thing about being someone who's performing on stage. <clears throat> you understand how, what the relationship with the audience is, yep. uh, how to time things, mm -hmm. and remembering lines and so on. Yep. But as a musician, you got to make sure you remember the lyrics. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think uh, I've seen a few videos where the person doesn't put, has forgotten his lines. I'm like, I've gone on stage and I'm like, I don't remember what I'm saying. So mm. I'm just going to fluff something and just walk off and do something else. And it's like, I think being a what is it like being a performer mm -hmm. that I, I like someone who has never done performing yeah. in front of an audience like? Um, so I would, and this was a ritual that I had for six years. Six years, because that was the length of time mm -hmm. we performed. I would always, I would always pick up the microphone, and I would stand with my back to the audience, and I would say to my drummer. Well, you brought me here, mm. and he would go one, two, three, four, and that is yeah. how we always, without fail, started every show. Yeah, because he was the reason mm. I was there, and I never forgot that. Yeah, the the the, the you know it's oh man, mm. you know when you tour, um, it's tough, and when you yeah. play shows, sometimes you're playing to the other bands, and yeah. that's it. And, and there's a challenge that and there's your it. peers. It's like, yeah, okay. Your peers that come out to watch you. Well, no, no, you're playing to the other bands on the bill. Right. But that's it. Yeah. You, there's no paying audience yeah. or anything like that. How do you go, well, that it's just a waste of my time. Yeah. I'm not going to generate any money from this. I'm not getting any mm. feedback from anyone. I get no crowd interaction. Yeah. Um, you know, versus some shows where. We played a show down in Christchurch, and my bass player just threw a three and a half thousand dollar bass on the ground and just dove in, yeah. dove into the pit at the very end. He yeah. was just moshing hard. You know, each show is different, but the the thing about it is, it's the performance, mm. and it's the there's there's a few different components to it. It's the need to be center of attention. Yeah. It's the need to express yourself creatively. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it was always the need to just be a ham. Yeah. It was just you know, I'm, I'm quite a quiet person in general, yeah. but on stage, it's completely different. You right. know, when I was, you know, when I was in the band, I created two characters, and that was the whole drama side of right. things. Yeah, um, I created the demon and I created the Joker. Right. The the demon was the one that would, and uh, we're talking metaphorically. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. You're about, sprout horns. Yeah, yeah, you're or, talking about like the duck. duck <coughs> uh, well, duck I'm talking character. about the one that would be like. I would yell at people yeah. and incite them to come up to the front of the stage and yeah. really interact with us. Yeah. Or I was the Joker, where I would say them just the most the weirdest things yeah. that you could say, like in between songs while my guitarist is yeah. standing there and he's tuning his because guitar, just suddenly for me to turn around and say, "Breakfast is the most important meal of the day," because and then it'd be like, "What the hell? One, two, three, four. Okay, we're going to start it, a song." Because that space between songs and tuning. That people could chat, right? Yeah, and they can go what, buy a beer. Yeah, they can start their own conversation. How do you consistently keep them engaged that whole mm. time? Yeah, you have to do something. Very few bands that do not need to talk about anything. I can think of two off the top of my head. One of them is Tool. Yeah, I was just thinking that Tool. Yep. They can they can just stand there in complete silence, do very minimalistic yep. movement, and they uh, it's the music. And yeah. it's the lights, and it's the show, and it's yeah, the because it's they've the, got all that thing yeah, art stuff yeah. going on in the background. You could just while they're doing the thing, just yeah, know it's whatever's yeah. going on. Um, another yeah. band that's like that as well as Meshuggah, and they, you know, they just stand there and they, they just exist. Yeah, but they exist to play the music, and they'll play the hell out of it. But mm. man, they are so good. Well, I mean. Tool's another one of those, uh, like the Lord did um, Nirvana things and like Pearl Jam, right? The movement kind of like that changes the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think Mastodon and all those guys that came after Tool in yeah. the 90s? Yep. Basically because of Tool. 
Yeah, uh, partially yes and partially no. Mm. I think Tool definitely came from your early progressive bands like Rush, um, yeah. Genesis. Was it Diamond Head? No, what, not Diamond Head. There was another one that was in the 70s that so was like that. They said like the book. Merciful Fate. There's definitely been a few, definitely been a few progressive bands mm. um, that, you know, everyone sort of drawn influences off. I um, remember listening to the, like documentaries about the whole, you were talking about eight, eight or something, the beats which are, like Tool plays at. Uh, was it four? Like four fours are normal, isn't it? Four fours the traditional standard. And then one, was that, two, three, was four. Was it four six? Was it that six four? Plays, six four that Paul, Paul plays at? No, no, no. They they use a lot of different old time meters. Mm. Um, so as a musician, if you can play tall and play tall well, you're actually yeah, you know, yeah. But then it's easy to co it's easy to imitate. It's yeah, hard to create. That's it. Yeah. So like you had a whole bunch of bands that would just come out and try to um, be like that. Yeah, all of a uh, sudden, you know, like, I mean, like Sugar, they, yeah. they created something, and then suddenly, you know, 100 bands just mm. want to do it straight afterwards. A White Chapel create Deathcore, yeah. 100 other bands want to suddenly yeah, do it afterwards. Metal. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. So, like, I mean, origin uh, over time, I mean, you oh. look at look at things changing. I mean, like, you look at Metallica and Megadeth coming out with Speed, yep. Crash, and then you got uh, stuff like um, Sega Reich, which, you know, the band, and they were like, were an amalgamation of Metallica, Megadeth, and Anthrax. Mm -hmm. And they even said on the record, it was like this, 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 yeah. Megalica or something like that. Um, and so, but they end up having their own sound. After yeah, while. they do. And I think that's the cool thing about it. It's like yep. after a while you go, well, I don't think we just want to be imitators anymore. Well, look at um, Corn and look at Limp Bizkit, right? Yeah. So we, we go back to the early 2000s on this yeah. one, right? So I'm going to show my age again, right? Well, I mean, I can't you, you look at that. Yeah. Rap, rap metal, right? Mm -hmm. Huge. Go back. A decade, yeah. Public Enemy and Anthrax, right? To bring well, the noise and bring, uh, and also um, Aerosmith and Run DMC. A decade earlier than that, yeah, was it? yeah. Well, and, um, and those guys get slated for it. That's yeah. just like, no, this is this is just horrible. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Limp Bizkit, Corn, yeah, they you know, do it. Lincoln Park, yeah. Everyone's like throwing rap in there, and it's like, yeah. okay, cool. So, you and know, now you got rap core. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I think. There is no so sort of like that's the cool thing about metal, right? There is no um, this is how we do it. This is what metal oh, there's, is. There's no, yeah. So, I think that's probably one of the big things I like about mm. metal is that there's uh, okay, and I say this with a big caveat mm. okay, because mm. baby metal will be the exclusion to this next statement, right? All right, metal musicians write their own material, right? All right, uh, excluding baby metal, right. but the majority of metal musicians will write their own music, yeah. Um, you know, because and they're you the guys at, who did it in the garage. You look at some of the yeah. more incredibly technical bands, and I mean the very technical bands. Yeah. Bands like um, Nile, um, bands like, you know, and there's just oh, oh, some horrific names. Yeah. But they write all the music themselves. Whether or not it's audible mm -hmm. and you understand it, yeah. uh, it doesn't mean anything. Someone actually had to sit down and create it. Whether or not right. you think their creation. Is worthy. There's a really. Well, it's, it's like abstract art, right? It's I've, like I've got a quote for you. Yeah. Pablo Picasso, great quote: "The chief enemy of creativity yeah. is good taste." Yeah. What is good taste? It's like yeah. It's subjective. Yeah. Subjective. Yeah, and I, it's like it's like the beauty is an eye of beholder, right? It's like mm -hmm. whatever I think is cool is cool. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to tell me if it's cool, and if, if we both like it and we think it's cool, it's cool. And if you don't like it, that's cool. Yeah, we can agree to disagree. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, and that's a cool thing about metal. I think it's just the fact that you have so many different uh, subgenres that you can be into. But you, like, I, I mean, I'm walking in and somebody's out playing Corrosion and Conformity. Never heard of it, mate. But yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I can listen. I can actually hear the music. It's like, yeah, that's metal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, well, I listen to, uh, you know, I listen to Anthrax. Yeah, that's metal. I listen to Iron Man. That's metal. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go, well, tool. That's metal as well. It is. Uh, and then you go up to, let me see. Um, Gojira. Gojira, uh, Baby Metal, you said, Ginger. Yeah. Uh, what's the other one with, uh, all I can think of is like Dunce Hat. That's so, that's Rammstein, too fast. Yeah. Uh, so you've got Rammstein uh, out yeah. of Germany. Then there's another one out of Sweden, um, a female singer. And, you know, it's like, uh, is it Bitch? I'm your bitch or something like that. Uh, no, Whore. She sings a song called, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm your whore. And I can't remember the, um, the singer. She's amazing. That band is amazing. And then you also had the other one that came out in like um, early or mid 2000. 
Evan Essence. Right? Evan Essence, Sammy Lee, yeah. Yeah, and so you're talking about opera singing. Yep. There's your vocals there. Yeah, yeah. She's got, um, but then go back further. Go yep. back, Bruce Dickinson. Yes. Go back even further. Yeah. Ronnie James Dio. Yeah. So you've got all these amazing, I mean, go back, go back further, Robert Plant. Yeah. And you just, yeah. And all of them, like, I mean, the changing, man, I just, and those bands, they're lasting. You know, oh, like yeah. Like we're talking about mainstream music, right? Yeah, yeah. So will these mainstream singers and their music last? 30, 40 years. Well, you know? let's, and that's um, the proof of the pudding, right? Let, let's it's... Should we talk about Hanson? Should we talk about <laughs> Aqua's Barbie Girl? It's... Should we talk about songs that, Look, uh, well, that are, are, yeah. are really essentially one hit wonders? Yeah. You know, um, that it, it all ebbs and flows with those guys. Yeah. But, you know, you, you look at the majority of metal bands, you know, how many good albums have the Rolling Stones put out? How many bad albums have the Rolling Stones put out? Yeah. And you the know, one good album will keep them going forever. Yeah. How many good albums have Metallica put out? How many bad albums have Metallica put out? I think after Black, everything was... <laughs> I think maybe Death, Meta uh, Metallic or Death whatever, Magnetic. Magnetic was okay. Yeah. And after that, nothing matters. Uh, nothing else matters after that. Coin of pun. Um, but even a Black, that lost me. You know, a metal, hardcore, like well, yeah. buying T-shirts, buying videos. You know, yeah. Cliff Moore. Yeah. Buying friggin' stickers, buying hats, and then all of a sudden going to Bob Rock and making Black album. And it's like, yeah. Well, they went to I'm Bob Rock away. because they heard Motley Crue's Dr. Yeah. Feelgood. And the, and that it was, was like, a big album. It was a huge album. Oh, big yeah, yeah. sound production. Yeah, big sound production just sort of made them millions. Yep. Grammys and everything, but lost the fans. Well, there was, well. Um, I remember quite, we were talking about Alice in Chains before and Jerry Cantrell. Right? Yeah. There was a really good interview with Jerry Cantrell. And Jerry Cantrell talks about um, Metallica because they, they're obviously quite close friends. Oh, uh, now and he, I remember. I mean, I remember freaking uh, James like being on stage going like this about you know the day that thing died, Lane died, and someone threw a bottle at him. It's mm -hmm. a bit disrespectful. Well, so he must. Me yeah. Metallica took Alice in Chains out on one of the really early big tours. Yeah. Um, but Jerry Cantrell's quote was, "Yeah, Metallica sold out." In fact, they sell out every night. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing with Tool, right? The song, Harry, um, Hooker with a Penis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, uh, I met a boy wearing Vans, 501s, and a dope BCT, new yeah. tattoos, nipple rings, and he told me that he was OG back in 92 from the first EP. And in between <laughs> sips of Coke, he told me that he thought we He's were selling out, it. laying it's, down, sucking up to the man. And, yeah, and I go, great and I go, song. It's one of my favorites. And yeah. that was what my brain switched on and said, yeah, forget the whole setup thing now, kid. And you know, at, uh, at thirty odd, some I'm like, I think I can't remember. I'm like, I must have got thirty-three or thirty-two when I heard. Then I was like, get over yourself now. Mm. People with bands selling it. How the hell do you expect it to live and you know uh, make music? And I think that's when I realized that Black was okay. Uh, and but then I started liking the album as well because I think of Wolf Man. It's a great, yep. great song. Um, Sandman. Uh, Holy, holier than thou. Yeah, there's some classic songs through that I love. Through the never, that yeah. was always one of my my go-to through tracks off that album. Never. Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, it's da, da, da. interesting because you know you have man, there's just so many really good documentaries on music to watch. Music. Yeah, um, you know, there's one that I watched by <sighs> who was it? Who was it? It was a, I, I can't even remember off the top of my head, but it was. It was a it was a documentary based around um, sub pop and that record label right. from Seattle. The Nirvana and uh, Nirvana. Not, not Nirvana, Radiohead. Radiohead. No, no, no not Radiohead. Uh, Mud Honey, Mother Love Bone, Ted, Ted um, all those sorts of guys. Right. Oh gosh. So I mean, no. Sonic U. So, that's the one. Yeah. That's what yeah. I thought it was like. Um, you know, yeah, Sonic, they, That's what me and Radiohead they, mixed up with. They that. had their yeah. own big massive fan base and then yeah. with the nirvana Alison mm -hmm. chains pearl jam Soundgarden, yeah with that all coming suddenly everyone's in a rush to sign the the and next, then, the and next then give them a label. Band, <coughs> the next big yeah. grunge band right but yeah. then suddenly all these bands that have been really actual grunge yeah well, before the name was labeled to the, yeah, the alt rock the alternative rock yeah. suddenly They've gone from being these cool bands that you you and the know in this town know yeah. about to suddenly selling 
albums, hundreds, and, you know, yeah. thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of records. Suddenly they're selling out, but it's like, okay, well, yeah, I'm a sellout, but my bills are paid. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't have to worry put, about put, paying my rent. Put food on the table. Yeah. Buy my I, house. Yeah. Own a home. Yeah. I, and now I, I can live. I, I read some really yeah. interesting stats about um, the lead singer Randy Bly from Lamb of God. Yeah. Um, he, and it's interesting, right? Because he, Lamb of God considered one of the big metal bands, um, modern metal bands. He takes, he yeah. has a yearly income earning of about $200,000. Right. Now, two hundred thousand dollars to you, to me, that's a decent whack of coin. Yeah, right. Yeah, but not if you're a freaking rock musician who has to freaking um, travel everywhere, yeah. pay bills, pay yeah. rent, pay taxes, uh, pay for the alcohol, pay for the clothing. No, no. So all that stuff doesn't get paid for. Oh, okay, right. That usually that that'll get picked up, and we'll, we'll okay. come into the next piece when we talk about management and stuff. Right. Um, but you, what you do do mm. is as an artist. A third of what you earn goes to the tax man straight away. Yeah. And exclude on top of that any management fees, yeah. lawyers' fees, accountants' fees. So you probably end up with one even 30%. 130%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because, 70% disappears yeah. straight away. So yeah. $200,000. Okay, yeah, cool. It sounds like a lot. So you're left with 60000 in the end. Yeah, basically. If you Just look at night, really, yeah, not that much. Yes, I mean, you get the good things like being able to travel the world. You get mm. a, a, an amazing lot of free things that do get afforded to you. Yeah, but um, you know, it's not as not as glamorous when you're away that often. But and, yeah, and then that also takes tolls on you. Um, so, <laughs> I can I get your t-shirt? It's not not my t-shirt. I'm guessing his one. His because his t-shirt's really cool. Oh right, you're talking about the um, that's a Punisher, Punisher one? one. Yeah, Punisher t-shirt. I can see. <laughs> no, don't read it. No. They don't, uh, these don't show up until I show it. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we won't put the last comment in there. Thank you, <laughs> Patricia. <laughs> That's um, very appropriate. Yeah. Awesome source. <laughs> um, All right. So we're moving towards um, management. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, do you want to hit management first or recording first? They both intertwine okay. in a lot of ways. So we, so can, we, can, we, can, we can talk about both if you like. Recording and management. Yeah. Because um, this is actually, knowing the business side of things is actually probably the one thing that most artists will often overlook. Yeah. And it's often the one that can get you the most caught, at, caught and tracked. Um, you contracts. Know, you, you know, recording contracts and all those sorts of things. Mm. Is it buffering? It's buffering. Here we go. We're back. That's weird. Um, so... You guys have probably um, self released an album. Yes. You got a video out. Yes. Uh, you've got a song on um, the tribute. Um, yep. The fundraiser for Christchurch. Yep. This is the next one's your second album. Yep. Or are you about to get signed and then second album? It's about to get signed and then second album. Okay. So, how does that come about? Um. Our bass player, our, our, our last bass player, um, he works for a company that deals with um, a, a guy who essentially has his own recording label and his own studio. And um, he makes, we, we make a connection, um, we get an introduction. Um, we sort of will chat and all hang and the guy who runs the label is actually really cool. He's also a musician as well. Yeah. Um, he started the label because he wanted to put out um, artists that were eclectic. So he was a big fan of John Peel. Right. John Peel was a very, very well-known... Um, Peeler. Uh, the Peel Sessions. Yeah, the Peel Sessions. Yeah, yeah. I grew up on that. Um, and he he, was, love, he yeah. did the, the John Peel Sessions, which UK's. was big on BBC yeah. Radio. Um, you know, he would play anything from like classical through to Napalm Death. Yeah. Um, and almost straight after each other. He... He never believed in just playing particular genres of music. It was yeah. very all over the place. I got um, the punk stuff out of the Peel Sessions because they put a, put an album together, the Peel Sessions, um, the metal. And I think that's what got me into punk. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the the guy's name was, was Matt um, Timatera. Yeah. Um, and he, he didn't have a metal band on there. He had a reggae band. Mm. He had your more sort of like 80s kiss rock type band yeah, glam. 
Um, he had an acoustic band on there. He had a, a, a like a, a soloist on there. So, so dude, there was just all instrumental guitars. Yeah. And so, so he's the, trying to put a, like a. <coughs> and he's putting together a, a roster of artists yes, yeah. that are very eclectic. Yeah. So we kind of fell into that. Um, we had recorded and now we had an album's worth of new material. Um, a lot of it, what, twelve songs. Uh, songs? yeah, about ten songs. Yeah. They'd, they'd all been road tested, apart from one, yeah. um, which I'd never written lyrics for. Yeah. They'd all been road tested, so we were we were kind of out there, um, and we played them. We made refinements, uh, practices mm. as we were going along. Um, he presented us with a contract. Um, right. We also happened to get a connection with um, Dave Dobbins' manager. Right. Um, we went and had a chat with her. It was uh, really really interesting. To sort of learn about a bit more ins and outs about the business um and then you know we sort of had a look at the contract um everyone sort of read it i had a look at it from my perspective and what i was looking right. for um and to me the main thing was that we were going to own our masters right. that that was going to be the big thing um masters and publishing are now, the, the things where it has the most long-term um benefit and gain yeah yeah the ownership of your music so <laughs> yeah now why did you think that to own your masters um was the thing the most important thing because is it because of seeing what happened with michael jackson seeing what happened with um sorry with jo george michael no all that sort of background music no. or no no i just wanted to make sure that if it didn't ever work out with us and the label that we would be able to take our album and walk away right as long as he recouped his money yeah i was i was okay with that you know because he was going to invest uh the the financial investment fell on him yeah to um record the album and then to get it all produced and mixed and mastered um as well as artwork and stuff like that uh, so yeah yeah we we quickly became um we we signed with them um but then we started having problems internally so yeah things didn't kind of didn't go the um the way they should have so what do you think like I mean, you guys are all busy, adults, yes. with yeah. kids. Mm -hmm. um, second album, yeah. contract. How much was the contract worth? Um, so we weren't going to make any money off it, but what it gave us the option to do was it gave us the option to make money off touring. Yeah, It gave us a wider distribution deal to be able to get our music out to a greater number of people. Yeah. So in metal, especially, you make the majority of your money off your touring. Mm -hmm. you, you do not make a lot off the actual album sales yeah um because i mean it's producing like producing the albums like so much like i mean i know you said the first one cost you less than a thousand yeah uh but that was because you know you did it at your own yeah, we did it thing, and, but then you got to get oh when you're producing and you got a record label they're going to get their own guys to come and do everything exactly and mixing and stuff and yep. that guys and asked for his own price yep for every hour you spend mm -hmm. you don't get paid for every hour he spends he gets paid for yeah uh and then the written then he's going to also charge you for the recording space yeah studio um how much did it cost for that um second yeah. album? we we had no financial liability on that okay. um the owner of the label also had his own recording studio yeah and he was also an engineer right so we we tracked that second album um out in helensville um all in his studio that he custom built yeah um and we we kind of did it all that way mm -hmm. so the time was just his own time um gear wear and tear and stuff like that was just kind of something that yeah so in terms of and like uh, the the rates he probably could have charged would have been about 150 bucks an hour yeah um and when you've got drums two guitars a bass and a singer probably like 400 hours maybe just under or something like that what are you looking at well drums took two days 10 hours a day so that's 20 hours um, yeah, 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 and we're only talking about recording. Yeah, now, vocals was a twelve-hour day. Yeah, because I did all my vocals in one day, mm. um, which is actually unheard of. Exactly, I was just thinking. I was like, yeah, what? I did a whole whole album's worth of vocals in a day. Um, and did the your voice break anything? Nope, because of all my, opera. All my training. Yeah, you know, and I and knew how to not yeah. out my voice. The training. I mean, this is the thing. Yeah. Like a lot of some people don't understand the training. The training. The training. The mm. training. You can't longevity doesn't come unless you have the training. In it. Yeah. Which is why I used to teach other other metal singers how to actually sing because I would notice that we would be playing with these up and coming bands and the the, the singers for the first two three songs they're strong it's yeah. a really good 
strong vocal, but by the end of the set, yeah. they're like it's all very weak and thin and they're struggling. Um, because they, it was all by that it was time all passion, band, no technique. Yeah. And by that time the audience is going, This is getting a bit boring. Yeah. Yeah. Or and you, know, you lose your audience. Yep. So, you know, we'll, we'll, let's get back into the management side of things. Um, and the recording, you know, when you're when you're looking at um, a, a contract, it, it really depends on what you want to get out of a contract. Now, yeah. I've seen one long form contract in my life, and it's about that thick. Right. And it's, it's like a, a Disney contract, <laughs> by the looks and sounds of it. It's a lot of <laughs> Disney's like about a, I think it's about a hundred page contract even before you get into anywhere. It's it's a lot to do with legal speak, right? But then there's all these little hidden bits and pieces that are just put in there. Like, so nowadays, for example, right, CDs and vinyl, those sorts of things are not traditionally done anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all digital, right? You yeah. know, Spotify, YouTube, Pandora, yeah. streaming services, just in general, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you sign up for, you, there's, a, there's a really great service called DistroKid, for example. Yeah where you can sign up for DistroKid, release your music to them, they'll get it out on all the streaming services. Yeah. You make a bit of money, they make a bit of money as well. Mm. But there's always other bits and pieces and, and contracts in one yeah. form or another. Now with a record label, um, nowadays with them mainly being digital, right? Mm. They will still sneak things in there like um, breakage fees. Yeah. Now breakage fees come from the days of CDs or vinyl yeah. where goods would get shipped out and, and cases might damaged. be broken. Yeah. Or so vinyls might break, so yeah. there's a loss, right? The yeah. artist actually pays for those breakage fees. Right. How do you have breakage fees in digital? Right. So this is, like, <laughs> this is and, and here's the thing, right? So <coughs> all these movies going into streaming now, yeah, right. So what? I guess they'll be charging those um, those directors breakage fees or studios breakage fees because they're going to streaming. Because those canisters should have been getting broken. Going so, through. so film canisters yeah. are, are quite a thing of the past. They don't really happen that much anymore. Yeah. It's all it's all digital. But yeah, yeah. Oh, I think this whole idea of I mean, it's so like we're talking about like you're teaching young kids, uh, up and comers, how to um, sing, yeah, and train their voice. Yeah, did you also talk to them about contracts and yeah. how to do management? Because yes. that that is, I mean. That's the same thing. Like when when people come to me with idea for comic books or writing, I'm like, "Don't tell me it." Yeah, yeah. Um, right. It's unsolicited material. Yeah. There's you've you've got no intellectual copyright on it. Mm. Um, and there's you know, and it's the same with music. It's the same with any any creative endeavor, yeah. unless you have a way of being able to show that the original idea is is yours. Yeah. Um, then it is it is open for um, theft. Basically. Yeah, and, and I think I mean because we, I mean, like artists are stolen all the time, and and people are claiming it as their own all the time. I mean, um, we, you know, we're all, um, uh, I think it was like a Chinese company was making T-shirts of a local artist here and claiming it for that th that was their art. Yeah, the royalties and nothing. Yep. weren't even aware just stolen off the internet. Yep, and so now. You've got your masters. Mm -hmm. I mean, you asked for your masters. So, thinking about the theft side of things, so I'm not saying that these were stolen. So, say that these masters are now released, uh, the tracks are released online as music, mm -hmm. just music, and somebody else sings over the top of them their own thing, and then that comes of themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that, have you seen that happen? Or heard of it happening? Yeah. Good thing is, is when you, when you, so nowadays recording music is, a, is infinitely easier than when yeah. I first started. Okay, yeah. Computers are a wonderful thing. As Trent Reznor said, they're just simply a tool for, for allowing people to be creative. Yeah. The downside of that is that, that now means that anyone with a computer can create a single and suddenly they're number one. Yeah. Um, look at Avicii and all the work he did. Mm. Um, Sonny Moore, look at all the work he did. Now, the name Sonny Moore may not mean anything to you, but you might know him better as Skrillex. Yeah. Okay. Just, just ripping stuff up and putting all yep. together. And Correct. Just... Yep, Mishmash, uh, Dead yeah. House. You look at well, all... Skrillex just did a freaking um, a YouTube anime music yep. thing to it, and I think it's called Obsolete. And I was like, wait, how does that, you know, like these yeah. guys get a chance to do that? Mm. And then you listen to it, like you're saying, like it's just bits and pieces of everybody else's stuff. Uh, or it can be, or it oh. can be original creations that they've done on their home. But nowadays, yeah. being able to record your own music at home is a lot more simple. 
look at what Billie Eilish did. Her first album is essentially recorded at home. Yeah. Okay. Her brother Phineas, right, that was them. Um, the Broods, who are from Nelson, mm. um, the brother and sister. Um, uh, the the Knots, I think. Uh, I know I think it's Georgia and Caleb, I think. Don't quote me on the, the brother's name. But they created essentially their, their first batch of music, then they worked with Joel Little to create a little bit more as well. Yeah. Um, but again, that's something where they started using SoundCloud or Bandcamp. Yeah. And they were able to get their music out that way. Once you have <clears throat> in a digital space mm. um it's it's open it is obviously open for theft with with places like soundcloud or bandcamp mm. it is you know the data it's uploaded in that sort of time that that's obviously registered in there is information yeah but also when you record through anything like any sort of uh, digital audio workstation the the days the files are on there um you know that 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 information is all stored in there as well did you guys end up releasing anything digital yeah our first album was also done digital as well and and this is like what we're looking at here about 2013 uh or 2012. <sighs> no no this would have been so this was our first album this was no fear of consequence right the second album sorry second album never got released never ah, saw okay so you guys finished it though and everything sorted so um kind of yes so you got a you got a master I have a version of the album. Yes, I do not. Own, I do not have the masters, but um, but I, I still keep in contact with the guy, so I could grab them if I want. But ultimately, have you guys ever thought of releasing this digital? No, no. Or like we don't. We, none of us talk anymore. Hmm. Um, drummer moved to Australia. All oh, right. No, no. What I mean is like, say, okay, say like, hey guys, you know what we should do? We should just like do like uh, crowdfund a uh, a. Yeah, you know, album a release of this and see what what it's like if there's anybody interested in this and you've got all this you know get the video to it you've got this history behind it um all this other stuff that you've done you got mm -hmm. um, like you got the first album and say hey you know what we'll do was if you you know if you get this we'll get the, put the first album on it and as yeah. well and you've got a package deal of fracture right yeah and other news on um but you look at the metal so metal. you look at the metal landscape seven years ago to where it is now uh, the, the landscapes two very very different things there's very okay. few live venues that are open nowadays yeah and not just because of what 2020 has but just in general all of the live venues that we pretty much mm. played at are gone king's arms why do you think that gone. is though I mean, uh, it's it's the it's the so for i i can only speak for auckland um when i had my first band before fractured yeah um we had a really we had two really cool places that we played at we played um, there was one spot, I can't remember the name of it, it was on Queen Street. Um, very small venue. Wait. Um, was it up the hill, climbing up the hill? It was not the high street, was it? No, it was on Queen Street. Okay. Actually okay. on Queen Street. Right. Um, and then there was another place out of Devonport. But these places have become gentrified and people have moved right. in. So these they buildings don't have been noise pulled down. Yeah, noise. Right. So noise, know. um, you know, zoning permits. It just gets too expensive. You yeah. know, so King's Arms is gone. You know, it's closed. That they, they no longer have That's shows. a well known venue. That's a huge venue for New Zealand. We played there more times than I can count. Yeah. You know, we we played there a lot. We played a lot of amazing shows with amazing bands. And that's an iconic institution of a venue and that's gone. But see that that being gone means that there's like no Places for, I mean, what limited amount of places to perform? Very, uh, so perform I, new performers I, are coming. I to think that all I know of nowadays, I think I don't, know, I don't even know if these exist anymore. Is the Ding Dong Lounge and Whammy Bar? Mm. I think those are the two venues. But then you've got bands that you know. There's just not as many metal bands out there playing nowadays. But to put it in perspective, right. I've been out of the scene yeah. for seven years. Right. So I have. No, and it changes. Current. There's the thing about it. All. Like, I mean, like you know, we're still talking about like um, how Nirvana came in after glam rock, right? Yep. And then after glam rock, you had uh, Pantera come in, yeah. And then you had a uh, tool come in, and then after that, um, you had um, what well, tool before Pantera? Yeah, tool before Pantera. It's 92, 91. When you had Undertow, um, Undertow album, then before you that, you had the OPAD EP. Yeah, so it's like about eighty. No, 90... Very, very early 90s. 93, I think it was Yeah. I'm trying to, like, because I was at high school, um, I was at, um, at my chef school 
uh, and that's when Undertow came out. Yeah. So I'm thinking about 92, 93. Yeah, that's about right. And I was, you know, Sober came in, I was like, boom, this is that balance band. Yeah. You know, there's a thing about like, um, I listened to a, a song and, and talking about how picking up a, um, you know, a single saying, this is what we're going to do it on, like you did with the video. And this is what's going to connect yeah, straight away. Yeah, we were talking about Sober, you were talking about Walk yeah, as well. You just know these yeah, are just things Plush, that you, yeah. And Teen Spirit and Lord's Royal. And mm -hmm. so how do the, like, because I'm always thinking like, if I would be a great person, I mean, you know, joke, I'll be a great person sitting in the manager's chair uh, at the recording studio going, album, album comes, go, listen to it, I'll go, this is the one that's going to be numbers. Um, no, that, that'll be the single that we should, you know, push this, um, this band out of it's like run to the hills mm -hmm. right um, um number of the beast and it's just this classic albums so getting back to um you know we were talking about digital now yep. so and management yep i want to talk about like um i mean venues like you're talking about like venues mm. with um in new zealand lack of venues and closure because gentrification gentrification in the ways is good but then also it pushes out people like i mean mm -hmm. a music scenes that were there before so you're now going to have hard rock you're going to have like maybe um pop mm. you know pop I, stuff. but I, you won't have metal yeah. and you won't have the hardcore fans i consider the days that i was touring as a musician i consider them to be probably one of the best times to be in the new zealand metal mm. scene we played with some absolutely amazing <laughs> bands um of just a wide variety of paper injury response, Mark yeah. Man, Dawn of Azazel, Set on End, Uproar, Fuel Set, you know, um, a Legacy of Disorder, we toured with them, um, Tainted, another big band. You know, we've, we've played with so many good bands, but there were also so many good venues. Yeah. And those venues uh, have now just sort of gone by the wayside. There's nothing really there anymore. So it, it does make it hard to get metal music out mm. when there's no, essentially no centralized place that right. bogans can go hang yeah, out at. Yeah, that, um, that could um, actually build well, discover. Um, experience. Discover. Build experience. So one of the, one of the good things I liked was that we would often be on a bill where there'd be like three or four bands, right? right. So uh, you'd have this person that would come along and they'd be like, oh, I'm here for this band. Oh, I've just checked out this band. They're actually really cool. I might learn a little bit more about them. Yeah. You know, you have that discovery period, right. um, you know, which was always very, very cool. And that was, you know, how, you know, my story with Whitechapel at the power station, yeah. I discovered Whitechapel purely because they were on the same bill. I'd never even heard of the name right. before. I was like, Whitechapel? Oh, it's bloody Jack the Ripper. Mm. Um, but sure enough, you know, they had these just, the songs were ridiculously fast. The yeah. dude's voice was ridic ridiculously low. Um, for me, it was just a great combination. And I still like that era of Whitechapel. Yeah. They've since evolved as a band. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I still go back and I listen to that old stuff as well. Well, I mean, classic albums will always be there. And I think, um, in a sense, I, you could always pick out... This is the thing about, like... I'll hey. stop there. I'll, let's go back to, like, um, how... <coughs> like, because, you like, back to your guys' second album, right? Yeah. Because we didn't finish that conversation about how did it not happen? Like, how did it not get recorded? I mean, it's got recorded. It got How recorded. Did it not get released. Um, our drummer. So there, there was a quite a number of circumstances. Yeah. So we, we knew going into the second album that we were going to lose our guitarist. Okay. Okay. So that that was hard because he was an original member and he'd left. Right. Um, he'd he'd left. He just wasn't feeling it anymore. He yeah. wanted to spend more time with his family. But then he came back, and I was reluctant to have him back because. Yeah. He'd left once and was like, yeah. no, it's... It's kind of like once been quite shot. Yeah. You know, and I, I, as the band manager, I was sitting more than prepared to pull him out on his own BS. Yeah. And I said, you know, look, you know, are, we, are you going to do this again? No, I'm in full on ball. Yeah. Sure enough, he did it again. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. Right. So we lost, we lost a guy that had just, uh, just an amazingly solid rhythm. Yeah. Um, we had issues with our drummer. Yeah. At the time as well. Um, there was a lot of infighting in the band. Mm. Um, I was starting to make a lot more things happen in terms of um, touring and shows and people's yeah, commitments. Setting things up. Yeah, people's yeah. commitments started getting in the way. You know, life started getting in the way. I was yeah. also a new dad as well, so I yeah. wanted to be there more for my son. Um, so 
that got really, really tough. Our drummer, then he tracked the album mm. and it just wasn't up to the standard that it should have been. So he ended up having to go back in and retrack it again. Wow. And it still wasn't up to standard. Now, when you mean track, so, so, so tracking is when you go in <clears> and record, right? Um, so he was going in and laying down the drum tracks. Yeah. Um, and they just, they weren't up to up to speed. You yeah. know, there was going to have to be a lot of time in post-production shifting, yeah. shifting a snare yeah. or a kick. They, and they would all just be out by a little bit, you know. So that caused a lot of tension. We ended up, he then ended up leaving, mm. um, which caused massive amounts of tension. We then got another drummer in and another guitarist, and that was okay. We, the drummer we knew, he was a good guy. Mm. Um, he'd played in another band who had since wrapped up. Yeah. And he came in for us. Unfortunately, he wasn't as technically minded as our old drummer. Yeah. So a lot of the songs were like 10% above his skill level. So we ended yeah. up having to drop them back. So we were making mm. compromises, it, yeah. compromises on things. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole band management dynamic changed. Yeah. Um, I suddenly was not attending practices. Right. I was more dead. Um, oh, more, more. I was more focused on being yeah. a present father. And yes, yes, Mister Mike Bota. <laughs> well, uh, he, he does. He did, he didn't uh, like. Well, I did one with him, and we haven't like changed. Um, I'm supposed to edit it, but well, I mentioned that like this is like long form interviews and yeah. discussions, and it's like I didn't. He didn't realize that like, sometimes one, like I did one like let's Thursday. Post, let's post the comment. Yeah, like we did one on Thursday that went for three hours with two gentlemen yeah. from America. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm actually proud that it is a Joe Rogan length show, yeah, by the way. Because I think the idea is you get more out of um, a proper discussion and um, uh, not an interview. I think interviews are kind of a gone era because interviews are more about like trying to get a two, uh, like what is it called? Like a bite. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're trying to get a bite to sell everything. But whereas mm. like when you're having a discussion, it's cool. The other thing I was going to ask um, is we're probably a, we're two, uh, two and a half hour mark, which is uh, a long time, but I haven't actually been bored for this whole conversation. Oh, thank because, you. Because, you know, and I'm not saying like I get bored of my conversations, but I mean, like, I'm learning about an industry I do know a bit about, mm. but not about New Zealand's yep. music industry. Yep. And I think all these bands, 90% of them I've not heard. Uh, because I've stuck to, like yourself, you said, you, yeah, you said this is what you're slimming down to. Oh, yeah. And then you kind of go wider. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard of Masugana. I've actually heard the music. I mean, Mastodon, I love Mastodon. Yeah. Um, and I got into Mastodon because I heard them, somebody mention it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who? And this is the thing about metal, I think, and I guess everything, like uh, uh, with like um, art and fandoms and pop culture and uh, metalheads and stuff, because like somebody likes it share it with someone else and in the old days we'd like chuck it onto a tape and you go hey oh, it's a yeah. mixtape create right? your own mixtape or mix cd yeah. Absolutely. and here's like here's of um his yeah. great make it out and think hey check it out his you know in, in your eps and most of the time um hey Catherine lee is this the same Catherine i'm supposed to know uh, you do know Catherine. yes so let's put it on there all right so it's yeah so i mean I discovered, um, I think, I discovered bloody metal because of YouTube, right? So this era, bloody metal, um, body metal, bloody wood. Is it bloody wood? I can't remember. Is it bloody wood? Yeah, yeah. And then I, I then I was a patron of theirs on on um, on Patreon, and so all these outlets in this era allows people to be creative and get their stuff produced. Um, do you think the scene would have been a bit more different for you guys if you had formed now? And been yeah, able we to... probably wouldn't have formed. You wouldn't have formed? No. No, uh, chances would have been relatively slim. Yeah. Um, and not because we, you know, we're all dads now and we've all got you know, things that we're going on in our lives. Yeah. I, I think the music scene is just so incredibly different from what it was. The landscape as a whole, fundamentally, like we were there when it started changing. Yeah. You know, um, like and, and, 20... that, and, that, and that's really the hard thing is mm. about 2013, yeah. it, it all started changing. The whole landscape of 
you know, bars started closing down. People started going more to digital. I mean, there were there were bands where you could now buy a USB. I remember a band called Darklight Corporation um, in 2010 going, well, you can, you can buy our album on a USB. Yeah. And they were selling it. They were light years ahead of where any other metal band was. And Dark Light Dark Light Corporation. Yeah. yeah. You know, they were they were so ahead of the curve and they saw where it was all going. So mm. it made things really, really interesting because you know, you go from the tried and true of, you know, you go, you tour for a bit, you go release an album, you go cut an album, you release yeah. it, you go on that tour cycle and those sorts of things. Um I'll I'll give you an example. Um, there's a band I like called Seven Dust. I love Seven Dust. I love Seven Dust. All right, I've seen that. Show me lie. Um, they started off in that cycle, right? Yeah. They then went through into the digital cycle. Right. They then went through into the crowdfunding cycle. Um, when did they go to the crowdfunding? I've been crowdfunding for a wee while now. Wow. Um, they um, they now are you know so you've got the advent of um online shows yeah you know, they were then you know i think it's either this month or well, next month that they're going to be playing their third album animosity start to finish and you can buy an online ticket i think tickets are like 15 bucks america but here's the thing but it's the closest we're going to get to anything at the moment yeah but here's the thing right it's only going like it's only going to be for a while for um and like not but, for us but for the rest of the world that yeah it's going yep. through the thing so but like theaters and the struggle of theaters trying to stay open mm -hmm. those pubs and those venues are not going to be there no because they're already broken they're already bankrupt and if they go like especially in america I'm looking at the guys over there you know the small businesses are just closing left right and center yeah. and you know people whose who's, all their livelihoods are mm -hmm. gone those venues who are open to metal they'll be like yeah no nah, i'm not going to be able to do that anymore so there's no venues so then digital is going to be the thing for it. But mm -hmm. the other thing I'm thinking is like, okay, they're performing online. Yeah. It's not the same thing. No, of course not. And it's not the same thing. And so the other thing that's going to bring into the whole experience of movies and music and mm. the whole, like the communal thing of, with theaters. And I'm the reason I'm talking about this, I'm going to give away two movie tickets. Thanks to our cinema event cinemas here in Whangarei to Wonder Woman. Three. Oh, and there's a reason. There's a question. Is I'm that gonna, Wonder Woman 1984? Yes, there's a uh, there's Dude. a question. There's a question that I'm going to ask that has to do with what we talked about tonight, and that'll be coming up later. And you um, and I'll I'll ask the question, but you it's off this. If you watched it, and sorry if you guys are internationally watching it, it's only for us locals here in Whangarei. And if you're coming up to Christmas to visit your nan or your auntie and uncle up north, then you could probably grab the tickets. Yeah. And I'll let you, um, you just have to email me and I'll, and I'll actually uh, post it out to you on, sure. on, on mine. So it's two tickets to see Wonder Woman 1984 on 28th of December. All right. Wow. And this is the first time I've done it. Man, that's cool. And uh, because I just went and I said, hey, guys, I want people to come to the cinema. Yeah. I love the cinema. So this yep. is what I'm talking about, the audience experience. Cool. Um, so the... And when you go to the movies, yep, or when you go to any public gathering, right, without music, and that, uh, you know, um, and the um, and the surround sound and the feel, the and the and the floor base, mm -hmm. the communal side of things, looking around, people getting experience, and not going to be to the yeah. actual performing on yep. digital, mm -hmm. you're not going to have the same experience because it's like watching a streaming at home, right, of a yep. movie. You're sitting with a couple, you know, your parents. You're not, you're not going to have to laugh at the same jokes because you're going to be like, I can't laugh at the same jokes unless your mates are there. But the other thing is, there's a hundred or two hundred people next to you laughing at the same thing, a mm -hmm. thing, just like when I'm watching Pantera at Logan Center, at Logan Theater, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm about five um, things back, and I'll. Uh, and so I was smoking the doobie up there and passing yep. it around. Yep. And you're laughing. You're like, yep. Oh, that's funny. And everybody's into a, a sweat and all that. By digital, 
there's this disconnect as much as you can. Okay. Um, so how do you think with the performing digital, I know even we'd have to do it because of what's saying, but watching a live, it's like, it's almost like watching a, a mass produced video uh, commercial, mm -hmm. right? Like we do with like, say like um, uh, Man in the Box, the first thing that came out of um, After Chance, I go, I love this, yep. gonna go buy the album. Yep. Well, do you think a concert by Seven Dust, $15 concert, is gonna have the same thing, I'm gonna go buy the album, but I've already spent 15 bucks. They're, they're playing off nostalgia though. So they're, that, that album is 2000s, early, like really early 2000s, right. just 20 years ago. This is probably their biggest it's selling album. It's weird that's like so far, and you think like, I mean, like this thing about music, isn't it? It's like, it's it's like the biggest selling album yeah. today. Mm. Um, it's the one that they had all the major label push, they had all the right promotion. Yeah. Um, I think they were signed with Universal. Um, for them, it's, Is it the one with Show Me The Light? Uh, that's Waffle. Yeah. That yeah, is Waffle. the second album yeah. that they did, <clears throat> which is Home. Um, yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, how else are they going to put food on the table? They can't tour. Right. They, just because just they can't tour doesn't mean the power bill ain't due. Yeah. No, power bill and the text means, And the text man's still and collecting. The text man's still going to be coming. The text still collecting. So, you know, the, the thing is, is we all have a shared collective experience when we go to events, right? Whether it be the movies, whether it be the Fringe Festival, whether it be the Plunge Comic Convention, whether it be the movie theatre, or whether it be the Fruta Festival, or anything along those lines, we all go there with a shared common interest. Right. Okay. We do that because, and you know, we often, you know, we often go to these things and we'll see people that we may not have seen for a while, yeah. and we're there with the same common purpose. Right. Okay. When you're when you're digital, your your experience that you have digitally differ from person to person. Yeah. I have a big screen TV and a sound bar. Right. Right. You might have a smartphone. Right. My digital immersion experience will be different from yours. Right. Now, it's a different way of looking at it because when we go to a shared combined event, right. your experience will still be different from mine as well because we will both interpret things very, very different. Right. So essentially what we need to do is we need to reevaluate how we think. Of, of things and how information is delivered to us. Right. Whilst we're not able to do them in a live combined setting at the moment, yeah. for, for people that want to support artists that they like, when I mean, they would normally spend 50, that, 75, 100, 150, 200 right. on a ticket to go see them, right. okay, with that not being able to happen, you know, suddenly a band like Seven Dust go, yeah. we're going to put on a show. You damn right, I'm going to buy. I'm going to buy a ticket, even right. though my experience will be different from the shared experience the first time they ever came right. to New Zealand, and I was in the front row, and I, I'm, yep. I'm not going to have that anymore. I'm going to get to see a band I really, really like play live in my living yeah. room. So my experience will be different from your experience right. because from it, everyone else's. And that's the thing. So like, <clears throat> even so, if you're paying the fifteen dollars, you're not going to be watching an um, iPod. No. I mean, on your on your tablet, right? You're going to be freaking, no. you know. Uh, I guess uh, if it was me, I'd be like, lights off. Oh, yeah. The screen on. Yeah. The sound to the blast and yeah. just like ready to go. Mm -hmm. And a uh, and couple beers. Oh, yeah. With a couple of yeah, mates. The thing <laughs> is, you yeah. immerse yourself in the way that's yeah. going to make you feel comfortable. Exactly. The, the shared experience is still there right. because you know that you're one of many, mm. but you can't interact with the yeah. many. You know, it's very personal. It's kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it's... But let me, let me give you another right. analogy. How different is it from a rugby game on Sky Sport? Yeah. And, and, and that's the same thing with movies, right? Yep. So, like, I mean, movie theatres and stuff, but... Well, movie theatres are essentially an extension of theatre. Yeah. That's why they're called movie theatres. Right. You know, you, you, we still go to plays and we can do those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Movies, not so much. We now consume them in a more digital, yeah, in a more digital way. Music is just uh, a lot slower to catch up. I was, I was thinking about um, when you mentioned that about not being able to go to the concerts yeah. because it's closed. But even so, even when they do perform, so sometimes you can't go to concerts. Of course. And so you end up like, okay, because I'm not able to go, I'm just going to watch a full live concert of, say, Lord performing in Santiago, mm -hmm. right? 
yeah. on stage and oh, watching yeah. thousands of people. You get, the great, you get the great camera angles. Yep. You get yep. all of the quality audio. Yep. You don't have some guy, you know, yep. some person next to you screaming in your ear. Yep. You know, you, you're not a shorter person standing behind someone who's like six foot two. Right. Going, and you're trying to push. See. Yeah, you're just trying, trying to, get to get around, you know. So you, there you, is a pros and cons. Of course, there is. <laughs> Um, you know, and wrestling's another really good one. I'm a, I like wrestling. Same. You know, yep. um, you know, you watch uh, WWE or AEW. Yep. Um, I would love to go and watch it live just for the experience. Yeah. But it's not like I'm going to be able to go, oh, wait, I know that was a superplex off the top rope. Right. Oh, he's got him trapped in, I don't, what the hell has he got him trapped in? I don't know. It's yep. just some kind of move. You know, because they, they're not piping in yeah. commentary exactly that's yeah. happening i'm not getting all those it's quality close-up shots yeah i'm like going yeah yeah and the nosebleed seeds because i haven't been able to afford the 500 right. dollar ticket at the front of the show yeah. whereas yeah. if you just watch it on you know i'll watch it i consume it on my phone yeah then i can consume it anywhere i consume it in my bedroom i consume it in do you think in my kitchen i can consume it anywhere at my disposal at my time and, and you're right on that because I was thinking like, what, that's one of the things that turned me off about going to the movies for a while was the idea of someone talking, and like a nice like the quiet scenes, mm. and you're like, or someone there with a phone on and answering on the phone, and yep. like, despite the fact there's like no phones, please, you know, and like, there's that side, but the how the like we're talking about this um, with friends today about. With the movies, like a couple of years ago, the movie theaters basically were told we're going to bring out this amazing sound and light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freaking triple H, whatever. I think yeah. it's 24. Oh, yeah, Mars and all that Yeah, stuff. and all yeah. that. And we got yeah. all this. And so theaters put in money and said, yeah, we're going to do that. And now they're saying, well, we need money. So we're not going to be able to release movies. We're going to take it to streaming. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to have like all these theaters. And like, but the way that, the cool thing about the theaters is, is that they've tried to make it like home with a big comfy chair. Oh, yeah. And an amazing surround sound from all around. Mm -hmm. And now we're able to but create... how do you do that with music? Right. But Nick's like... How do you... So you've got movie theaters yeah. that have nice, big, comfy chairs and, you know, there's gold class at Sky City in Albany, right? Yeah. yeah. You have this and you have the little pop-up table and you can... Order, yeah, you know, Maltesers, the turn up, yeah. and a, you know, the you know, beer, the wine, the freaking um, glass. Yeah, how can that be translated into the live experience of music? And there's only a very few ways you can do it. You can either have Metallica when they did their mm -hmm. Black Album, they had the Snake Pit, yeah. which was the pit in the middle of the yeah. the, the full stage. Um, you can have people standing on the sides, mm -hmm. um, watching from the wings. But that's really about it. There's no limited in a sense. Yeah, it and is. I think that's where Tool comes in and puts the whole stage production on. And I Madden comes in with the whole song yeah. changes. And I, yep. there's a new, um, what are they doing now? I think they was talking about the new thing that's they've come out with the new album. Well, you've got holograms now, don't you? That's yeah. another one. You know? Yeah, and so they're Two going. Parks, uh, concert would have been amazing to see. Yeah. I just think it's so, just, but um, that's the thing is creating the new if ambience. Everyone has to try and work out what the new normal is, and and every you know some some people are are struggling. Some industries have embraced it and they've been able to do quite well. Yeah. Um. You know, for me, I think the big thing is is you know how do you do it in a way where everyone can move forward? Right. Uh, I think some people have got the really good idea. Um. You know. Um. Michael Boda, who who has has comment on here, mm. um, uh, he he is starting to get his content up online, so he can get himself, um, he can get his name and his his brand and his work, his creativity mm. out to a wider mm. audience. Um, you know, so um, talking about whom? Uh, Ruby Tibbets. <coughs> yeah, check these guys out. Who is that? Uh, Ruby is Mike. Partner, it's not really a place for me to comment on though. So, <laughs> so all right, so we'll leave that. So here's the thing. Yeah. Um uh, let's ask let's, one, one final question. Yeah, that's what make it the a good last one. words. Okay, so make it a good one. And final. Yes. Like last words. This is my thing for the thing. It's like to ending everything. Yeah. I mean end, ending the discussion. Last words. Right. So before that, um, so it's 
two things. So before that, I want to ask, what do you think the next generation of music, young and upcoming musicians need to know? Pay, Having your pay, pay attention to the business. Right. Know the business side of things. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. Don't think the business will take care of itself. There have been numerous, I mean numerous cases where artists have just gotten absolutely screwed over by mm. you know what used to be record labels record labels mm. nowadays are no longer the major player yeah um your your streaming services make sure you know the ins and outs and the inside of 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 what you're spinning up for you yeah. make sure that you you know you know what your rights are um make sure that you have really good um a really good support network of people behind you because mm. at the end of the day it's a business it's called the music yeah. business and people right? forget it's, that it's like yep. the art business people yep. forget the art yep and the business part of it yeah it, it, it's it's arts and commerce have never yeah. meshed together well because yeah. they're two diametrically opposed right. things but you need to take care of the commerce or business side of things so you can continue mm. to be artistic and be creative you cannot have one without the other. So learn the business really, really well. And know what you're signing. Know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Um, you know, make sure you understand what monies are going to be coming in. Right. You know, um, in terms of relating to music, what what publishing you're going to be coming in, what your payments from um, the APRA uh, are going to be. Which that's are, New Zealand, that's New Zealand. Yep, a recording yep. agency. Yep, that's is the it one. Artists? Recording artists. Um, so loyal. That's a royalty thing. Right? Yeah, it is. Um, so, you know, understand that where you're going to get all of these little revenue streams from, mm. um, you know, it, it, you have to focus on the business side of things. You cannot just simply assume that the business will take care of itself. The business won't take care of itself. The longevity of like uh, being a musician. Yeah. Right. Um, how do you like, I mean, what's the second final question? No, I was just thinking like, um, like a lot of bands survive. You look at Iron Maiden they survive, like, are we going for 40 years? Sure. As a metal band. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, One of the out of many, how many? Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like how many bands do you how metal many, bands let, Okay, let's bring it down to a national level. How many New Zealand bands are still going? I and I mean know. New Zealand bands. Yeah. I, yeah. Don't I don't mean, know. I don't that's mean I don't metal know. bands. I yeah. mean New Zealand bands, period. No, but, and this thing, it's like, um, they don't. They, there's like a maybe a ten year cycle, and that's it. I think she had did really well for a while there. They tried to break into America and with um, you know, pacifier, pacifier, mm -hmm. and that. But they're, they're, they've been living in Australia longer than they've been in New Zealand. So yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, Lords maybe doing okay. I haven't seen a new album come out. Maybe um, okay. So she, she's released two albums. Right. Cool. Um, so so that's within Royals, about five years. Lords Royals within came five out. Years. We. Uh, ten years ago. Ten years ago, yeah, I'd say. Okay. Cool. So within ten years, she's released two albums. So maybe another one should be on the way. But that's the thing. So I'm like thinking, like, um, there's another, there's, there's someone as an open that does it, uh, um, a uh, acoustic, and she's released her own album as well. She does her own music. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember, uh, but, but I did play it on the um, on Beagle Radio when I was doing that in 2018. Mm -hmm. And you know, so. Like we're talking about digital artists being able yeah. to create their music themselves yeah. and then they put her out there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like, okay, Dave Dolan, maybe for New Zealand. Sure. Um, she had in the metal scene. Um, I was, I thought Eight Foot Sativa would do it. Oh, no, they've long gone. They've been gone for and, years. Yeah, I thought they would survive because everybody was like, you know, big on Eight Foot Sativa, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you look at. Um, but music and trends change. Yeah, but the, like there's nothing. No. Maybe let's hope that. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember. Um, our boys from Waipu. Alien weapon. Right? Alien weapon. Let's let's see alien, as young kids, 16, 17 year olds. Let's see them maybe for another thirty years. I'll tell you what. Well, let's see them do the second album. Right. Because the second album is the one that can break a band. Right. Okay. Uh, and the reason being is when you have when you have your first album, it's accessible as it is. You well, you, well any band. Any okay. band that has their first album, right? You've got a bunch of time to write it. Right. Okay, so you might have one, two, three, four years yeah. to get an album's worth of material that you're really happy with. You've played it, it, it gigs well. You can see that people respond to it. You know there's going to be some 
hits and misses, right? Yeah. When you come to the second album, you don't have because the, one, well, the two, record three, four going, years. Yeah. It's record. not even so much the record company. No. It can be, you know, we just we need to get another album out. I mean, we we is it financially up. thing is it a financial thing to get a new album out to sell a new album or uh, it, you, you can you can tour uh, one album to the ground eventually it's the law of diminishing returns so. yeah everybody's heard it they want right. something new exactly all right um let's do the final words um uh, you got five minutes to come um you have the floor to say whatever you want to say and cool. it's yep all right so you when you're young and you're creative be creative uh, do as many creative things as you possibly can mm. um never doubt that your creativity is going to be seen or interpreted by a large amount of people it, it, re it actually really doesn't matter everyone has a creative bone in them to some degree it's that it's just the, the amount of creativity that people put out right mm. um always always be creative never stop being creative if you're going through hard times be creative about it if you're going through good times being creative about it um you know the the type of creativity is so wide mm. you know be a potter be a, a painter be a sculptor um be a musician um be a be a theater person um you know create and is any way that you are happy with find out what your creativity is and then just stick with it mm. Um, one thing that happens is that creativity often gets left by the wayside um, because life, yeah. you know, I, I don't have the opportunity to follow my dreams. It's not about, you know, if every single creative person was like, like you, like yeah. you, for example, it's like, I'm going, I want to be an internationally published comic author. Yeah. Well, that didn't happen. Okay. Well, I'll just give up on my dreams. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, why? Mm. Why, why? Why do you need that level of success? Why is not any sort of success a win? I remember going to Wendy's uh, in Teatro to North, Teatro to South, and Teatro to South with my son, my son's mum, and we ordered food. And I had a kid come up to me and go, Hey, are you the singer for Fractured? Mm. And I went, Yes, I am. Mm. He goes, hey, can can you just wait here for a second and i waited there and he ran to the car got his album bought it back and he said can you sign this thing i said absolutely mm. one of my proudest moments because i wasn't doing anything yeah i was ordering i was eating right. i was getting dinner and someone recognized me mm. and asked me for an autograph didn't happen that often because let's be honest metals yeah yeah um you know but that was a small win that probably made my year. Right. Because just it was just one of those things. So never stop being creative. There are so many ways to be creative and talk with other creative people. Find out who the creatives are in your area. Get to know them, understand them, learn about them, you know. we we all have a common goal and interest, and that's to get what's in us out into the wider world so people can see it some people will appreciate it some people not so much but you will find people that will appreciate it mm. no matter how weird obscure or an avant-garde and bizarre it is get your creativity out there know the business if you are wanting to turn your creativity into a business understand your business know what you're wanting to do know where you're wanting to go know how you can market yourself because essentially at the end of the day you will become a brand you know mm you will be assigned a brand and it's just how you choose to live that brand i've met some absolutely wonderfully creative people in whangarei um from so many different genres of of creativity and it's been just so nice to be able to just talk with them in general not only about music or about their creativity but what they have to offer and for me that's the most important thing is these people are wanting to be creative in their chosen field so that's it never stop being creative know your business that's it excellent all right guys uh we're almost to three hour mark and like i said it's been an interesting um informative 
an interesting, informative, and uh, a look at the music industry in New Zealand. Um, and like, like um, Mark said, creativity comes from, you know, it's just not. The other thing about creativity is it gets, like you, you did say, through the bad, be creative yeah. through the bad and the good. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times it's the the best creativity comes out the bad because you your experiences or things that you've gone through or you're feeling, you know, that emotions coming out. Like a lot of songs you wrote, you said yeah. came up from personal experiences. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of artists, if, if you're not an artist yourself, a lot of artists use uh, those downtimes to actually be very creative. And I think, and that helps them mentally. I think it helps a lot of us mentally to get that emotional baggage out onto a, you know, a canvas, into a, uh, into a public forum, into a public forum, yeah. into a mu uh, music. Well, actually, no, let, me, let me rephrase that. Not necessarily into a public forum because not everything that's released needs to be <laughs> yeah. handed out. Right. Um, um, <coughs> what, what what it, what it gives you the opportunity to do? It gives you the opportunity opportunity to actually begin to work through it, if that's your process. Right. Some people will have their own way of working through things. Creatives will traditionally tend to work through through things their own way. The the two biggest songs, well actually the three biggest songs that we ever had as a band were all born out of dark times. Right. And that's not how I chose to deal with it. It's just it's just something that happened. But it was very therapeutic for me. So yeah. All right, and that note. Thank you very much. That was really cool. Thank you so much, Mark. Hey guys, it's the first. This is my first time I uh, we've done an in-house proper live in-house guest interview, and so um, like I said, I love the cinema. I love the experience. I've been waiting all year to go see 1984. I wonder Woman 1984, Black oh, Widow. Right. So the question of the night. Was um, now was it the first song or first release? That song there, yeah. But um, you can't tell what it is. So no. So guys, the, uh, earlier in the discussion, the I said that I wrote a key lyric for a song. That lyric was, "I will devour all your hope." The okay. question is, what was that lyric? What song was that lyric from? Right. So let me write this down. So um, I will. I will devour. All your hope. Right. So, what is the title of this um, song? Yep. Yep. Of this song. Okay. So, um, email, and here's um, it's a local thing. So, it's Geek Out Metal. You've got to get it be in Whangarei or New Zealand to one, be able to one, get it. One, and three. I'll, yep, and I'll post <laughs> it, and I'll post it out to you guys. Uh, <coughs> And thanks to my, uh, you know, my friends who have been a real good partnership with us, with Plunge, uh, um, at Cinemas, Event Cinemas. I always say Cinema City. It's Event Cinemas. Yeah. From right. Big shout out to Event Cinemas. Um, Thank you so much for doing this. Guys, this is very, very cool. So two free tickets in Wonder Woman 984 on the 28th. The day it gets released. Uh, for you and a partner, for you and a friend, yep. um, just email me. And title of the song, so which means it's going to be weird because you guys have been watching. Listen, and if you have been watching, listening, thank you so much. So, thank you so very much from us, and thank you from uh, for watching the narrative. And wherever you are, please be safe and uh, have a great Christmas. This is our last one for the year, and we've done something about sixty of these this year, uh, and um, wow. quite excited. Uh, we went through a very major period this year with uh, two lockdowns uh, and um, lots of amazing people from all around the world, artists, uh, writers, uh, business people, lawyers, uh, actually no not lawyers, politicians, uh, financiers, bankers um, and um, you know showrunners and convention runners uh, like someone who runs about 12,000 people, Alan Zier. Uh, conventions, um, Mark with a band, in New Zealand, and to be honest, I had never heard of Fractured before because I've been out of the, right, the whole scene for years, and all I've just stuck in my little world, little world of music. So I'm quite excited to learn all these other bands I haven't heard of. I mean, I've never listened to that name of God. 
I've heard the name so wow. many times. Wow. Machine Head. I might have listened to one song wow. on, on YouTube and stuff like that. So there are so many bands we mentioned. And, you know, check them out. If you're into metal, if you're not even into metal, check out the music side of things and look at the documentaries, why they do that, what they do. Um, I mentioned uh, Shellac. I can't remember his name, but Shellac uh, um, basically turned his... Um, is a drive behind the whole albums scene of going to analog. So thank you so much, guys. Kakite Ano, we'll see you next year. If, if if we don't find someone else to come on this year, but I think I'm all done for 2020. And uh, we've done like 60, 60 shows, wow, right? That's so a lot. interviews. That's a lot. Hour wise, I don't know how many hours of 100 hours of those are. So thank you so much, guys. Kakite Ano, thanks, Mark, once again. Thanks, And um, see you guys. And have a good Christmas and wherever you are, whatever you, how celebrate it, celebrate it with friends and family and enjoy yourselves.